We're excited to have you with us today. And uh, I'd like to just really set the stage for our time here together. So I first want to start off with thanking our, our many partners. First, the Future of Children, the Princeton Bookings Institute. Bookings Institute, delighted that you were hosting us, that you've been our partner, that you've been every step of the way there for us to make this happen. Also, to the Rutgers School of Criminal Justice, in the law school, Dean Todd Clear. Also, we are very grateful to the Rutgers Edward G. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Thank you, Rowan, for being there for us and making this happen. This has been a two year long effort and is actually chaired by Dean Farmer over at the law school and Reverend Howard at Bethany Baptist Church in Newark. And I just want to thank them too for really being a part of helping us think this through, helping us to begin the strategy to think of how we can support both the youth in our communities as well as the families. So what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about why we came to this place and why we thought it was really important that we begin to have a discussion with you, those in the fields, those practitioners, those on the policy side, around what we can do to best support New Jersey's youth. How do we do it? How do we think about it? What is the data? What is the research telling us? What do we know are the issues? And then how do we work together to partner from a policy perspective, a practitioner level, to make sure that we actually have the right interventions and can support the young people and the families uh, that we hope to, to really make sure that they have the best outcomes. So we have started this series of forums and discussions and you are now in the fourth of those discussions. We will have one more discussion as we wind up this initial process. We will be in Camden on June 13th, and we invite all of you to join us again at Rutgers, in which we will begin to focus on the strengths of our youth and to really build on the wonderful and positive things that they do. So that's what has brought us here today. So I'm excited for this panel. Thank you so much for joining us. So we will start initially with our first panel. We will have a short break and go into our second panel. And as the day goes on, you'll have the opportunity to really talk to the folks that are here, to talk to each other, to use this opportunity to network with one another. That's another piece of what we plan to bring to you is really the opportunity to have a really robust, wonderful discussion. So without delay, bring you Elizabeth. Thank you. Donahue, I'm the Assistant Dean for Public and External Affairs, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson School. I just wanted to um, make a little pitch for um, something that we've started that's new this year, which this um, forum is part of. We've started a series of policy forums. Um, what we're really trying to do at the Wilson School is be uh, cognizant of the fact that we live in New Jersey, and we have neighbors in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and New York, and that there are policy issues that we at the school are grappling with um, that are very pertinent to what's going on um, in this region. And so we've started a series of policy forums where we bring people together on an issue that's really resonating um, before our state legislatures and on our governor's desks and try to um, pick them apart a little bit with um, research and with practitioners and policy makers. So um, I hope you leave your email with us and we will tell you about um, our policy forums as we go forward. We've had a number this year um, on issues that have ranged from juvenile justice to merit pay, um, and to this one we're doing one on immigrant children. So um, anyway, I, I know that um, these are the sorts of issues that you all grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis, so I hope we can stay in touch and let you know about what we're doing. Um, so with that, I'm really just going to turn this over to our presentation. As Wanda said, we're going to focus today on fragile families, and I'll leave it to our speakers to... Um, tell you what that means. Um, so first we're going to hear from Sarah McClanahan and Irv Garfinkel. They are, um, Sarah is a professor here at the Woodrow Wilson School in sociology as well as the Woodrow Wilson School. She's the editor-in-chief of The Future of Children, that beautiful volume you have in front of you. And um, she runs the Center for Research on Child Wellbeing, which is a center of the Woodrow Wilson School. And joining her is Irv Garfinkel, who is from Columbia and runs the Columbia Population Research Center. Both of them were issue editors on the Future of Children volume that you have and really have been the leaders of the study that um, gave rise to this volume as they will describe. 
uh, will break, and then we'll hear from policymakers and practitioners and researchers who focus more on a regional basis. So thank you and welcome. Turn this. How do I make this stuff? The keyboard? The keyboard, yeah. Oh, and then I can just go down here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, this first slide sort of illustrates for you the problem that uh, gave rise to our study of fragile families. So this is the percent of births to unmarried mothers as a proportion of all births. It goes back to about 1940. And as you can see, uh, this number, this proportion of children born to unmarried parents has grown a lot since 1940. And uh, in 1960, it's gone up about four or five times since it was in 1960. Now, the numbers here are slightly, uh, the levels are slightly higher for African Americans and Hispanics than for whites, but the increase, the trend line, is exactly the same for all the groups. So this trend uh, gave rise to a number of questions that family researchers uh, and people interested in disadvantaged families and poverty had. And so this trend gave rise to the, these four questions. So what are the capabilities and circumstances of these unmarried parents, especially the fathers? I mean, we really, at the time that we began our fragile family study, we really didn't know very much about these families, what the nature of their relationship was, and what, and especially how the fathers were involved. Um, the second question was, what is the nature of the relationships at birth, and then what happens to this these relationships over time. So there were a lot of conflicting stories. A lot of people said these couples were, these were very casual relationships. The mothers don't even know who the fathers are. At the other extreme were people who said, no, these are very much like marriages. They're just as stable and just as committed. So we had just a lot of different ideas about what was going on with these couples. And then a third question was what happens to the parents and children in these fragile families? over time. Are these families doing just as well as married parent families in similar circumstances? Or is there something about this family structure that actually makes uh, it harder to raise a child? And then finally, we had the question about what are the implications of what we learn about these families for policy makers and for program administrators? So the fragile family study, we began in 19, really we started around 1996, but by 1998, we were ready to go. So we went into uh, about 75 different hospitals in the United States, in 15 different states, and 20 different cities. And we sampled uh, mothers soon after they had given birth. And we oversampled for non-marital births. So in each hospital, once we reached a certain quota of marital births, we just, we just took the non-marital births. And we sampled on beds, so we have a representative population. We interviewed the mothers uh, right after the child was born, and in most cases, we were able to interview the fathers at the hospitals. And we conducted follow-up interviews with these parents when the child was one, three, five, and nine. And at three, five, and nine, we actually went into the home and did child assessments. And in the year nine, we actually interviewed the children. So we recently submitted a proposal to NIH to re-interview these families and the children. The children will be turning 15 in a couple of years, so we're hoping to be able to go back and find out how they're doing now. Um, and I should just mention that one of the 20 cities in our study was Newark. Philadelphia was another study. So the first question, I'm just going to provide you briefly with some answers to those uh, four questions that I posed earlier. And I'm going to talk about the first three, and then Irv is going to talk a little bit about the policy implications. So what have we learned about the capabilities and the circumstances of these families, especially the fathers? So the bottom line here is that uh, these families have very low capabilities. 
So as you can see, as compared to married parents, they're much more likely to have dropped out of high school, much less likely to have any uh, higher education. Uh, their economic status much more likely to be poor than married parent families, much lower earnings. And in the bottom set, they're, they have more health limitations, they have um, slightly, they have more drinking problems, although that's pretty low. Uh, one of the big numbers to come out of this study that we had no one, I don't think, in our research group had really understood was the high percent of the fathers in these families that had been incarcerated prior to having the child. So early on, we realized that we were dealing with a population, our fragile families was a population in which incarceration and criminal justice policy was playing a big role. So uh, lots of the fathers had been in jail and many fathers would go back to jail. So this is a big issue for these families. Uh, here are a few other characteristics of, just to describe these families are uh, less likely to be white, more likely to be Hispanic and black, less likely to have grown up with both their parents, and more likely to be young teen mothers. So the second question is about the nature of the relationships at birth and what happens to these relationships over time. So I think a big surprise for a lot of researchers was to see how much um, actual connection there was between these parents at birth, given some of the stories. So about 51% of the parents uh, were living together at the time the child was born. Another 32% were in what we call visiting relationships. So they were romantically involved, although they weren't living together. So that's 83% of these couples are, are in romantic relationships at the time the child's born. Another 8% were said they were just friends, and only about 9% of the parents said that they had very little contact. The fathers were also very involved during the pregnancy and at the time of the birth. And we asked um, both mothers and fathers about father involvement, which you can see from this list of percentages, the fathers gave money and they helped the mother during the pregnancy. They came to the hospital to visit the child. Most of the children were gonna take the father's surname. His name was on the birth certificate. And most importantly, the mothers and fathers said that they wanted to raise this child together. Um, now, some people thought, well, you're just picking up this kind of very rosy period right after the birth of the child, and things might be different if you had checked with these parents six months later. But we had some researchers doing qualitative interviews who actually interviewed these parents a little bit later. And they found the same story. The parents really did have um, this high level, or at least high hopes, so you can see here uh, uh, an example of this. So if we ask the parents, these are all the unmarried parents, what's your chances of marrying this father, the father of your child, or the mother of your child? And as you can see, 75% of the mothers uh, thought that they had a good chance of marrying the father. They also, most unmarried parents, think that marriage is better for children, although the unmarried parents are lower than the married parents. Um, interestingly, most of these mothers think that an unmarried mother can raise a child alone. That's uh, quite a bit higher than the married mothers. There's also quite a bit of distrust uh, of the, among the mothers for the fathers. And um, down at the bottom, you can see there's a little more domestic violence in these families than in married parent families, but the overall level is pretty low. Uh, and finally, the second from the bottom row is that this is supported in a scale as a measure of the relationship quality as reported by the parents. And you can see here that there's really very little difference in the relationship quality score uh, reported by the unmarried parents as compared to the married parents. So this, this looks pretty good uh, at the beginning. You can say very, we, we call this sort of the high hopes at the time of the, the child's birth that these parents are gonna be able to make it together. However, uh, most of these families are not that stable. So you can see the bars here. The red bar is what happens to the married parents and married parent families. The yellow bar are for the families who are cohabiting at birth. The uh, sort of turquoise bar are the, couple, the parents who are in romantic relationships but not living together. And then the last bar is the parents who were not, who were not romantically involved at birth. So you can see that after five years, uh, many of these unmarried parents are no longer in a relationship with each other. 
And in the second set of bars, you can see that they have begun new partnerships. And then in the third, you can see they begin to have children with the new partners. Now, here's another picture of just the amount of relationship transitions that's going on. So one of our big arguments coming out of this study is to say that these families have experienced a lot of instability. There's a lot of partnership changing going on. So you can see here that only about a quarter of the mothers and the fathers do not experience any transition during the five-year period. And uh, nearly about 45% of the mothers experience three or more transitions uh, before the child is five years old. Now, actually, let me, while I'm here, let me just point out that very often in the transition, there'll be a new child, as you can um, see in the previous slide. And so what happens is that these families become more and more complex. So they, because they have a child with a different father, and I sort of think about how difficult it is to arrange visitation, arrange child support with one non-resident father. So for a mother that might have two children with two different fathers, that's doubly difficult. And if you had three different children with three different fathers, just imagine just the transaction costs of trying to manage those relationships. So now I just have a few bullets here to talk about what happens to these parents and children over time. So we do a lot of uh, research sort of looking at how important is this instability that goes on these transitions and how important is this complexity that is having children from other fathers. And it turns out that complexity leads to a lot of jealousy. If you, all, if you have a child, but if you have a child in a, with another partner, when you enter a new relationship, uh, it, it, it causes jealousy among with the new partners. And every time you go visit the child from the, with the old partner, that can create a, create a problem. So we spent, we have a lot of different researchers, a lot of Princeton, Columbia, other places that have been looking at how all this instability and complexity plays out. And here are just some of the uh, basic findings that we come up with. So first of all, there's a lot of evidence that this instability leads to poorer health. Every time there's a change in partners or a move in or, out, or a move out of a household, there's a spike in mother's reports about anxiety and depression and also just overall health. Uh, every time there's a breakup, there's uh, an economic cost uh, and there's a lot of material hardship in these families. The instability and complexity also affects the parents' ability to provide high quality parents. So the fathers uh, who don't live with their child spend much less time with the child. They also contribute less financially to the family. If the father has children in multiple households, he's more likely to not contribute to the child in our study. And when he leaves that family and forms a new family, we can see that he is contact and his contributions decline. Also for mothers, these transitions, this instability leads to more harsh parenting, less uh, time involved in literacy activities with the children, and just generally less quality parenting. And finally, all of this plays out in the children uh, themselves. So we know that the children in these families, because of the instability, have uh, more likely to have health problems like asthma and obesity. They have lower cognitive development, and they also exhibit more behavior problems and more acting out and more actual shy and depressive behaviors uh, as well. And it looks like these behavior problems are especially acute for boys in these families. So it looks like the little boys have already had you know, they're already more act, likely to act out and to have behavior problems than girls, but they're especially affected by this instability. Okay, so we're going to talk now about the policies. Good morning. So there are um, two broad categories of thinking what uh, might be done. Uh, and one is prevention and the other is amelioration. And I'm going to talk about uh, two forms of prevention. What I mean by prevention is that we would have uh, fewer children uh, growing up uh, in fragile families, more growing up in uh, stable families. 
Um, and amelioration is, no matter how good we do a job of prevention, we need to also have policies uh, that address uh, single parent, uh, fragile families, and make the lives of the children especially, but the lives of the adults living in those families as well, uh, more secure. The, um, and two, two uh, areas of uh, prevention, uh, one reducing non-marital births and the other reducing incarceration. So uh, this slide uh, shows the uh, unintended pregnancies uh, as a share of all pregnancies. And um, uh, you can see there's a pretty high incidence of unintended pregnancy uh, for the unmarrieds, especially the young unmarrieds. So we can do a better job of enabling women uh, to have the children they want to have when they uh, want to have them. Uh, that's an important element of prevention and of policies. And we know we actually have some evaluation that shows mass media campaigns that encourage uh, men to use condoms are, are effective and the benefits uh, exceed the costs. Uh, teen pregnancy prevention programs that discourage sexual activity and educate teens about contraception use. And I stress the two of those together. The, uh, we have evidence that simply discouraging, uh, just say no, doesn't really work in the high school curriculum, but combining the two uh, does work. And uh, finally, uh, Medicaid programs that subsidize con contraception uh, uh, are effective. And again, it turns out the benefits uh, of doing so exceed the costs. And this intervention has far and away the uh, best benefit-cost ratio. It's also the most costly, but the returns are the greatest. Uh, second, uh, we were kind of stunned, and shouldn't have been in retrospect, in the first two cities uh, that we did interviewing, uh, nine months af uh, after the conception, more or less on average, at birth, 4% uh, of the fathers were in jail at the time of the interview. And we said, well, that must imply there's a large percentage of fathers over the course of the whole year and prior who must have been incarcerated. This slide shows what's happened to US incarceration rates over the course of the 20th century. And there's this great escalation that starts in this, the latter part of the chart. Uh, where we just soar well beyond rates that we have ever had in our history. So, I mean, you know, one possibility is suddenly uh, Americans got let worse, more crime prone. Uh, the other possibility is we changed policy and started incarcerating people that we didn't use to incarcerate I think the latter is far more likely to be the case. And this is a slide that I think 100 years from now will be an embarrassment to us. It should be an embarrassment to us now. Uh, we have the highest incarceration rates in the world. Now, what do we know about that from fragile families? Given we found there were so many, we actually started doing research on this, getting data on the extent of incarceration. And it's possible that children would be better off if their dads were really bad guys. That they'd be better off uh, if the dads were incarcerated. So that's a possibility. But that's not what the research shows. Uh, what we find is that the reduced that fathers are incarcerated as a consequence of that, that reduces the financial resources that are available to the mothers, and it does so in two ways. Uh, one, because the fathers don't live with the kids, uh, they have less, they can pay less child support because their employment situation is worse. That's the smaller 
of the two effects. In court, if you wanted to dream up a policy that would break up families, you could not dream of a better policy than mass incarceration. And, we, and the big effect in terms of resources available to children is that incarceration reduces marriage, reduces cohabitation. Uh, guys who come out of jail, jail was not a good training ground. Sometimes it's our only place where we can deliver training, but that's kind of a sad statement. We also have evidence of increased material hardship for the families uh, left behind. And this is not just because the father is providing less, it's also the case that incarceration, if the family wants to stay in touch with the father, incarceration increases the costs of doing so in a non-trivial fashion. Men are incarcerated quite long distances. Uh, mostly they're from big cities and they're incarcerated in, in New York and some uh, in the northern uh, rural parts of the country. That's a very common phenomenon across the country. As I said, uh, if the result, the net effect could go either way on the children, but in fact, uh, incarceration uh, increases aggression, very strong effects on aggression, most especially on boys, but on girls too. Not zero for girls, most especially the effects are bigger if the father was living with the kids, but there are even negative effects, much smaller, but even negative effects when the father was not previously uh, living with the, with the child. Uh, the effects on children's attention problems are a little weaker, but there's some evidence there as well. So uh, reducing mass incarceration as a, a means of prevention of formation of fragile families uh, should be really, really high on our agenda. Uh, incarceration, uh, there's lots of uh, research on this. We still need more. But um, there's a, we know there's a decline in wages, increase in drugs, but there's also been serious changes in policies, uh, and which I think it's fair to label them as uh, punitive sentencing. Uh, there's now been calls for uh, new guidelines for sentencing, um, which I think are, uh, we're seeing this across the political spectrum now. Um, incarceration is really expensive. So Grover Norquist, the uh, libertarian conservative who uh, more or less wants to reduce spending, all government spending, has now targeted uh, incarceration, and uh, I welcome him as an ally in that particular <laughs> <laughs> issue. Uh, and we need to find alternatives to incarceration and uh, need to find ways uh, to make work pay, which I'll come back to in a moment. No matter how good a job we do, even if we were to eliminate, uh, get incarceration back down to where it was 40 years ago, uh, we're not going to uh, put families back together again magically. Uh, that's a long-term process. It's going to take us uh, generations, I think. And in the meantime, uh, we have to support, improve our support for the children who are growing up in these families and for their uh, parents. And um, I have to say, if you look at our data on fragile families, one of the things that comes out is just how pervasive, uh, how big a role in the lives of these families uh, are, are state programs, welfare, what I call welfare state programs, play in the lives of, of these families. It turns out uh, welfare state policies play a large role in the lives of married families too, and I'll show you some slides about this. Uh, but married families have much more income of their own. The fragile families, Sarah talked about the low capabilities, so they can't generate 
that much income. So relative to the income they can generate, compared to the benefits they're getting from programs, the benefits play a much bigger role in their lives. So they get bigger benefits, plus they have lower resources of their own. So the quality of these programs is just looms large in their lives. And what I'm going to suggest is there's some ways that we can improve the support for single mothers uh, and do it in a way we want to make the benefits uh, decent and adequate, and we can do that in a way that uh, encourages work. Uh, we had a welfare reform that was built around uh, encouraging work uh, for single moms. And uh, I think the uh, policy objective, uh, with one major exception, is completely appropriate. And the major exception is, during the first year of life, it's a mistake to require single mothers. It's a mistake to require mothers, period, uh, to work. It's, uh, and I'll say something more about that. Uh, and I want to talk, I'll say something about the importance of early childhood uh, care and education. So here's a uh, slide that uh, shows uh, the income packages of married uh, couples, uh, cohabiting couples, single couples, and uh, the last group unstable is just the group that moves uh, from one to another. The first thing that sticks out about this uh, slide is the uh, married couples uh, have so much larger uh, income. That's what you want to take away from that. And the big source of, the, uh, of their in, uh, income difference is that they've got these uh, much higher earnings. Uh, earnings, the, the mothers have higher earnings, but more important, uh, the fathers have much, much higher earnings. That's the purple bars. Um, this slide shows the benefits uh, that both married and unmarried mothers get. And you can see the married mothers get a lot of benefits uh, from government, as well as the unmarried mothers. Uh, but the unmarried mothers uh, get more, uh, 16, uh, almost 17,000 versus uh, 12,000. Uh, and back to the previous slide, uh, the, the top bars there show the benefits, and those benefits uh, loom much larger for these, uh, especially for the stately single. Uh, this group right there, you can see the benefits uh, in dollar terms amount to very good by 40% of the uh, total, total resources that they have. So I want to say just something briefly about fatherhood and marriage programs. Um, we've been involved, consulted on these. Uh, I think they're worth pursuing uh, in terms of research. I don't think we're ready to go to scale with any of these programs. I don't think this is a magic bullet. Uh, but what these programs um, are designed to do is to provide people with better relationship skills, uh, which I think is a valuable thing. Uh, as I say, I don't think by itself it's a, anything like a cure-all, uh, but worth, worth uh, expanding. Um, lastly, uh, the child support enforcement, a uh, couple things to say about that. So, um, first of all, uh, multi-partner fertility, which Sarah talked about, uh, complicates uh, child support enforcement uh, dramatically. Um, it reduces the willingness to pay of the fathers if they've got, uh, for each case, if they've got two different house children in two different households, uh, their willingness to pay for each of the households actually will decline and uh, even more serious if they have three. Um, it turns out in our data that informal child support is really important, it plays a big role, is more common in dollar terms up to about three years after the relationship, the romantic relationship, sorry, up, 
it's more or less a romantic relationship. But up until three years after the couple split, living together, um, uh, informal support is actually larger than formal support. And so how we enforce child support, we need to pay a lot more attention uh, to and encourage, uh, and if we can actually increase the amount of support. Uh, and this slide uh, just shows that, uh, what I was just saying, shows the, the informal support, the two lines that start high are informal support and total support and uh, informal support, the uh, uh, lighter line, the white line, you can see it dramatically drops off. And formal support is this line at the bottom, the yellow. And it gradually picks up, and it's only at uh, three years afterwards that it turns around. Um, and here, I, I want to just make one comment. So child support enforcement uh, really important, this is not just a, uh, should not just be cost recovery. Uh, it really is social welfare policy uh, writ large. And right now we impose obligations on low income fathers that are much higher, a percent of their income than for middle income or let alone upper income fathers. And in some cases, it, they simply, the obligation is so unrealistic, 75, 80% of their income, they're never going to pay that. Never. But it acts as an albatross around their necks. Uh, and it's insane, is the only word I can use. Uh, so we have to make obligations. I, I am a very, I believe very deeply that every father should contribute something, something to their children's uh, upbringing. And financially, I'm talking about. But it has to be realistic. So you, and you can't enforce an unrealistic obligation. Uh, here's one of the most grievous parts of child support. We throw a guy in jail, his child support obligation continues. He builds up arrearages that will never be paid off. Another egregious thing is in a number of states, uh, fathers are slapped with the Medicaid costs of the birth. That's slapped onto their obligation. I, you know, they're just things that make no sense that we're doing across the country. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to applaud you for saying that no women should work in the first year of their child's birth. <laughs> I really like that policy. Um, anyway, so just a couple of things I wanted to add. I'm Allison Hart, and I work for the Corporation for Supportive Housing in, in New York. Um, and I just finished up doing a study with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for three years called Keeping Families Together, which was a project designed to see, to test the impact of supportive housing, so affordable housing plus services on families who are both chronically homeless and child welfare involved. Um, and we didn't look at incarceration rates, but, I'm sh but most of our moms were single moms, and I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to point out, sort of in addition to um, the policy fixes that you mentioned, you know, what I hear um, in New York is that there's a lot of um, policies that really um, disincentify people to, from staying together, um, such as SSI, for instance. We had a couple in, in supportive housing who 
separated because their benefits were greater if they lived separately than if they lived together. Um, and even in the housing world, um, we treat people as individuals and families. Um, and so lots of times families separate when they go into a homeless shelter, obviously because they don't want their kids to be there, but also um, many programs um, that sort of help people out of housing are geared towards single women. Um, so I guess I just wanted to add that and wondered if, if you looked at housing at all in your study, housing stability. Right. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple papers that have looked at housing, mm -hmm. and um, Amara Curtis uh, has done work on that along with Amanda Geller. And they find that, um, especially public housing, not, not, title, <coughs> not title VIII, but uh, public housing, uh, the rules are uh, quite strict now, and uh, it's very risky for a mother to uh, take back a guy who's been incarcerated. So there are negative effects on housing, uh, on uh, uh, cohabitation and marriage because of that, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I was wondering if there's any room and recommendations to add um, family supportive housing as an alternative to incarceration because I feel like it would be a great place for families to remain together with supports. Um, it's not incarceration. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Mark Valley. I'm from an organization called New Jersey After Three. And it, sometimes after a presentation like this, I cringe when one of the solutions is a public relations campaign. But I'm wondering, in this case, the information is very compelling very powerful, um, and some of the graphs make it very clear uh, what some of the consequences of these kinds of things are. So I'm wondering, if, has there been any thought of you approaching foundations or other funders to try to reach audiences in maybe traditional or non-traditional ways uh, that might you know, effectively get to some of the people, maybe even at a young age, uh, to help communicate some of these messages so that at least the information is being shared. And so I didn't know if there was any thought to that. And one thing I thought might be compelling, although maybe slightly misleading, is overlaying the graph of incarcerations um, and, and the other, the, the graph of um, the, the out of, out of wedlock births. So I, that might be slightly misleading, but <laughs> have you put thought into this? Uh, well, we have. We do, we are trying to get the message out. And in fact, that's sort of one of the reasons we did the volume. And uh, the volume, we hope, will spin off a lot of smaller products. That, so all the research is in the volume, but what we're hoping is we can take some of the messages and have the volume as the backup and then take the messages out to a broader audience. So that's exactly what we're hoping to do. Actually, Robert Wood Johnson was a, one of the funders. I should have <coughs> had money from about 20 different foundations. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention that I forgot was we have a website. If you just Google Fragile Families, uh, it'll pop up. And there's a, on the publications, it can, you can look at all the different topics that we've uh, written on, housing, um, child health, all kinds of things. So if you just go to the website and, and hit the publications. We've also put out about 20 what we call research briefs. They're two pagers um, that sort of summarize things that are in different research papers. But I agree that getting out this information, I think the sort of the biggest message we have here is that these are families, they're not any single mothers. I mean, if you look at the percent, the only 3% of our unmarried mothers uh, never had a partner in the five years that they were, uh, their child was, until their child was age five. So these are fragile families. And uh, even after that couple breaks up, there's a new father, social father in the picture. And I think you're right, our policies were really designed um, for single mothers, we're designed when most single mothers are widows. And you know, they don't fit the new families 
that we have today. And so all kinds of like issues like not having if the father has any criminal <coughs> any felony, he can't ever be in the public housing. That would be an example. So how is he gonna come home and live with her? I was just thinking in terms of a lot of the folks in the audience are advocates or nonprofit leaders, mm -hmm. um, faith based leaders. And if we had sort of on your website, sort of a, a, a sexy five minute boil down of what you just presented to us, mm -hmm. it could encourage some of us to use, uh, to sort of roll it out as parent conversations. A lot of us do parenting programs uh, and are, you know, have parents as part of our constituencies. And so that, that's kind of the sort of very boiled down, condensed version of something a little exciting that I think would be really f fundable for us. That's a great idea. Yeah. Elizabeth is <laughs> in charge. <laughs> Um, I was interested in your graph of, um, about income um, that showed that unstable uh, singles, families have more income, more public income. I, I'm assuming that that's from emergency assistance. But not everybody has emergency assistance, so I'm just wondering, not every state, so I'm wondering if you could show that graph again and, and explain that to us. <coughs> yeah, that one. So it's uh, definitely. No, uh, that not one. emergency. Well, but uh, this one, but this one, this one gives you what the oh, detail is, is where they're, they're getting the money from. Right. So, and this is at, this is the five year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, early childhood education and care is the single biggest item at five because some of these kids are now entering uh, kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, food stamps is is big. The uh, health care is uh, Medicaid is after the early childhood care and education is the the single biggest. That's health. Then there's food. There's housing assistance. Someone had asked about uh, housing earlier. Uh, cash assistance uh, would be uh, TANF and SSI. Um, so, so what constitutes your category of unstable? I guess is what I was. Uh, Pardon. What are the factors that you dis that distinguish someone as unstable in your in the next in the bar? Oh, oh, I'm yeah, yeah. The unstable just so there that just means that sometimes they cohabited one of the years they cohabited another year they didn't so they're switching from single to cohabiting. Okay, so that's, that's the question then. Why is their income? Greater than I see, I see. Okay, because when they, when they go have that, yeah. Got it. Okay, so I misinterpreted that graph. My other question was about uh, the TANF legislation of ninety six, ninety seven. Yes. Um, you talked about the work requirements. Um, has anybody studied the um, the impact on on family formation in terms of numbers of children compared to the AFDC world of prior to TANF? I know. Um, no, in, in, a, in a word, uh, we don't really have any good evidence. We, there's a, there was a slight decline in non-marital births, and some people have attributed that, uh, that, uh, that came right after, but the, right after the, uh, or maybe four or five years after. Mm -hmm. But it's a blip, and so we don't really uh, okay. know. And, and the other thing to point out is two other things were happening that is very important um, at the same time. So one is that we had the best economic conditions 
that we've had uh, since uh, the 1960s, and it was actually even better than the 1960s. So the, the biggest, best post-war expansion uh, that we've had economically uh, was in the 1990s, coincident with uh, welfare reform. So if we, that, and that's part of the reasons the caseload dropped dramatically. A second thing is, and this is not as well known, but the actual amount, total dollars of benefits going to single mother families actually increased if you look at before welfare reform to after welfare reform, the total dollars going to single mother families increased because they just got the benefits from a different source. So the earned income tax credit benefits were essentially doubled under Clinton. It was the first thing he did as president, the very first thing he did as president was huge increase in the EITC. Remember, he campaigned not just to end welfare as we know it, but to make work pay. And the EITC did make work pay. And we also increased child care assistance. So the benefits, the increases in the EITC dwarfed, and the child care dwarfed the cut in the AFDC benefits when we went from AFDC to camp. So their, their lives were actually, for most of the people who would have been on welfare, they were actually better off than they were before. And I say most because there is a group at the bottom who were worse off and suffered. And this is especially true for those who had some kind of um, uh, mental health problem, most especially depression. And if you think about, and we have evidence of this from the Fragile Families data, so who is it that, get, that actually winds up getting sanctioned because they can't uh, go to work? And the answer is, by and large, it's people who are depressed. So these are the very people who need assistance, and all we did was kick them off the caseload. Uh, and a lot of them wound up homeless. Oh, homeless. Yeah. Yes. So there's this the small group, the most needy, actually was hurt. Which could have and should have been helped, but it was hurt. And I, can I just add one more thing? I forgot to uh, say, I, it's not that I think uh, we should require uh, mothers to stay home during the first year of life. <laughs> I do not believe that. I do believe we should have paid family leave and enable uh, mothers to stay home and fathers to stay home to take care of their kids in the first year of life. So I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Green from the Nicholson Foundation. Uh, I raised two points, and I came a little late, so if you've covered it, I apologize. Uh, the first is drugs. Um, if you broke down the incarceration rates by type of crime, um, drug possession, drug trafficking is going to emerge as a very high percentage. So with regard to fragile fan, families and with respect to incarceration. Um, it seems to me um, that there are significant policy uh, implications of that. One, of course, is drug court. And I don't know, maybe Wanda does, uh, about the percentage of people that go through drug courts who are parents of young children. Be interesting to look at that to see the impact on the families. I don't think anybody studied that. Uh, the second intersection is, of course, with child abuse. And particularly during the first year, the most prominent reason for uh, removals of children is the drug abuse of the mother. Um, now, there is a program in Miami. Um, using dyadic therapy, which is shown to be pretty effective 
by getting the mom into that treatment early on in terms of reducing the substantiation. It doesn't have specifically to do with drugs, but that's an intervention in terms of teaching relational skills that has been shown to be effective in the family court in Miami. The other thing that I was struck that wasn't mentioned was um, programs uh, for pregnant uh, um, women, and in particular, Nurse Family Partnership, which I think has the strongest research base and longitudinal studies that go out to age uh, 19 that showed uh, substantial improvements in terms of the stability, separation between the next child, and even effects on the teenager who was the child of the mother who received it. There is, uh, of course, uh, one problem with that's very expensive, and you can only address the most seriously uh, at risk uh, women, David Olds, who developed the program, uh, states that very firmly. Nevertheless, there are a couple of other programs, one of which is Centering, uh, which uses a group model of um, perinatal intervention. And very promising, David Olds has now developed a group model called P3, I forget what the three P's are, uh, that he's piloted both in Great Britain and in Denver, and I'm, we're very hopeful we can get three new sites, uh, partly funded through my foundation, hopefully funded through RWJ in New Jersey, in Camden, Patterson, and Newark. So I just want to make those comments and hear any responses. Okay, we have time for one more question. And, or two. Good morning, uh, Richard Panzer from the uh, Institute for Relationship Intelligence. I'd like to ask you to talk about the research on marriage education programs. I know there's been some work in Oklahoma and some other states, and PrEP and Relationship Enhancement Education and a few others. Well, they have the, uh, there was a big evaluation of these federally funded evaluations from five different sites for these marriage um, programas. And the, the report came out recently, and overall, they did not find any benefits. Um, but it's, if you take the sites, if you look at them individually, it looks like that um, things were actually got worse in Baltimore. And they got better in um, the Texas side. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. So the Oklahoma side, there was actually more stability, better quality relationships, and in the Baltimore side, things were worse. And we try to, you know, this is just, this was the first initial um, report from Mathematica Policy Research, and they'll be following these families a little bit longer. But I think the, one of the lessons that I take from this is if the Baltimore side if you look at the characteristics of the people who were in the program, they were much more disadvantaged and much, and they had a lot more problems. So I think the lesson may be, you can't do this for everyone. It's not gonna work for everyone. And if you, if you go too far down the um, continuum of, um, of what, what's there for the couple, uh, or the, their potential, that you may actually make things worse. Like, for example, there was more domestic violence in that, in that side as a result of keeping some couples together that possibly probably should have been kept together. On the other hand, in the Oklahoma side, which was a slightly higher, uh, more cohabitation, they actually had married couples involved in the sort of program. Uh, there it seemed to be quite... Uh, the other little... The other piece, uh, if you take all the sites and put them together, it looks like the program had benefits for African Americans, more so than the other groups. So there's some, you know, the preliminary evidence from this, I would say, is, is quite mixed. You know, there's, there's, it suggests that something, there may be something good can be done there, but at this point it was kind of targeted. Also, I have a question about, um, I mean, the surveys that I've seen show that among young people, um, I don't know if you saw the MTV Associated Press uh, survey, they found that I believe it was it was more than 90% of the uh, 13 to 24 year olds said that 
they, they did not believe that marriage was an outdated institution. And I think 92% said they, they intended to or definitely or probably would get married. So my question is, given that it seems that there's more interest among young people in marriage than most adults think, um, what, what potential do you see for programs that have conversations about, about marriage? So I think you're right that in, we show that even in our couples, I mean, most of them think marriage is the ideal. That's what they want, and they hope that they will have that. They also have a very high bar for marriage. They don't think they can get married, interestingly, until they have reached a certain level of economic security and a certain level of trust. So whereas in maybe the 50s, a young couple got married and tried to build up some assets, the couples today feel like they have to kind of have certain assets before they can uh, get married. So I think that it's not a problem that people don't value marriage. The problem is they don't quite know how to get there, to do it, for, and, and then to follow through and to kind of stick it out. Um, mm -hmm. Before we take the last question, I just want to make one parenthetical comment, which is that the uh, future children issue, there's one whole chapter on the marriage programs. So, uh, and I just want to call everybody's attention, because almost everything we've talked about, there's much more uh, detail in the future of children issue. Hi, I'm Simran Noor, the Annie Casey Foundation. Um, in thinking about the capabilities of parents, particularly uh, one of the things you addressed was lower um, earnings and economic status, um, possibly linked to lower education. And I was wondering to what extent in the policy um, implications have you considered or thought about family economic success strategies, workforce development, and training programs paired with um, high quality but affordable um, child care for parents, um, thinking about how fragile families I think the early childhood uh, uh, education and care uh, is critical, and having high quality uh, child care um, is probably the single most important thing uh, that we could do. If I had to pick one policy, uh, that would be the, the first. Uh, and I want to stress the high quality uh, element of that because I think we have good evidence that high quality care makes a, uh, makes a big difference. A low quality care can actually be a negative. Um, so we, the United States uh, led the world in the 19th century and throughout most of the 20th century in mass public education. Uh, First, first in elementary school, that was 19th century, 20th century, high school, and college. The rest, after World War II, especially after 1970, the rest of the uh, rich world and some of the developing world has caught up to us in high school education where we were far ahead and we worried about dropout rates. They didn't call it dropout rates, they just, nobody graduated high school practically, uh, they caught up and they surged ahead of us in early education and child care. And um, it's one of the reasons we're the richest nation on earth is because we did such a great job in mass public education. And we should work that we are behind in early child care education.
Um, but before we do, there's an important announcement. Apparently there's a number of cars out in front, I think on the circle, but you cannot park there and there are some people down there about to tow it. So if they're out in front, did anyone park in the circle? Or park in a meter that... They usually don't tow for meters. No? Okay. I'll give you a ride home if you get towed. <laughs> Should be careful about offering that, right? Okay, we're going to get started again. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the uh, research portion of this morning. I know it was a very broad brush, so I really do encourage you to read the Fragile Families volume and also to visit the website. In addition to the two-pager there that I mentioned, um, I should backtrack a little bit and just sort of give some background to what the Fragile Families study is so when you go to the website, you know what you're looking for. So essentially, this has been this nine-year um, study so far. As Sarah said, the, where they went in, they, um, they interviewed 5,000 mothers with an oversampling of unmarrieds. And they've been following these kids now at one year, five, three years, five years, and nine years. And they actually have an incredible return rate for a survey. Um, I can't remember what the data are, but it's about an, a 90-something percent return, uh, repeat rate for the mothers, and it's pretty high for the dads, which is amazing when you see what those breakup rates are um, that they find the fathers. Um, so it's a very rich source of data, but what happens is then the data is clean and it becomes public source. And so researchers all over the country go in and you know the, the survey questions basically expand every year. And, you know, each year they've been adding, so each year they've added health questions, they've added mental health questions, behavioral questions about the kids, housing questions, you name it. They keep adding questions to the survey. In year nine, they actually did a DNA sample, and a, a study's about to come out next week that looks at um, DNA interaction with um, social environments, which is going to, I think, get a lot of press. Um, so there's this whole rich body of data that researchers across the country have used so you can go in and look for papers on all these different issues. So when you go in, it's a little confusing to the website. There's the initial baseline report. But if you're interested in a particular issue, be it child care, housing, what not, um, do a search, and you'll find that um, breakdown. Is that right, Michelle? Do you want to add anything to that? I should also add, Michelle DeKlein is here, who has worked on this um, study, in particular looking at the Newark data. And so if you have any questions about how the fragile family, because there were, you know, there were cities across the country that were surveyed, Newark was one of them. And so Michelle's taken that data and really broken it down to Newark-specific um, information. So if you work in Newark or are interested in um, that, please talk to her. <laughs> are there any other questions about the study before we go on? No? OK. Um, so now what we'd like to do is take um, the panel discussion to a more regional basis and really look at research in our region and New Jersey. So looking at a lot of the same issues that we heard about this morning, but uh, less macro and more regional. And for that, we have Katerina Roman, who's an assistant professor um, in the Department of Criminal Justice at Temple University, and Deborah Ward, who's the executive director of the Economic Development Research Group and is at Rutgers University's School of Public Administration and Affairs. So um, we're going to hear from the two of them. Then I'm going to break it a little bit just for short Q&A if you have questions about their particular presentations. And then we're going to open it up to our practitioner panel. And we have three people talking then. Um, LeVar Young, who's the president of Newark Now. Richard Stagliano, who is the president and CEO of the Center for Family Services. Stagliano. Did I say that correctly? And um, Christy Cordier, who's an AmeriCorps VISTA leader. And I'm oh, sorry. It's Elise Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at an old. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Apologies. Um, but still a VISTA. Yes, yes. Same home. Same organization. Sorry yes. about that. Um, the three of them will speak. And then what we'll do is really open it up to a group conversation. So you may have some questions at that point about the presentations, but I would hope at that point we can make this into more of a group discussion, pulling all the pieces from the day together. Okay, so enough of overview. And um, I think you are going to start. Yes? Thank you. 
Well, thank you everyone, and uh, thank you Wanda and the folks from Princeton for having me here. What I'm going to do is move the discussion away from families and, and youth and children and individuals more toward a community focus. Um, I've been very interested in how you develop and maintain healthy communities. So I, I titled my brief talk, The Role of Community Organizations in the Well-Being of Neighborhoods. And, and um, how this comes about is I'm a criminologist. I, I spend 20 years evaluating programs, partnership programs, crime prevention, gang reduction, and I've really tried to think about what works in community change, not just regard with regard to crime reduction, but in general, healthy outcomes for children. So in, in all the research that's out there, in the late 90s, 2000, 2001, there's been a lot of discussion about collective efficacy and that phrase, how to make neighborhoods more collectively efficacious. And, and in my research on collective efficacy and thinking about the studies that were out there, I thought, well, if this is the silver bullet that makes neighborhoods stronger, it has it, collective efficacy buffers against crime, it also has these positive outcomes for children and families, how do we make neighborhoods stronger? What do we do to increase social networks, a sense of community, strong and formal associations? So I want to situate the work that I've done first in a very academic approach, but it's a comprehensive framework looking at neighborhood health. And most research, public health researchers out there, sociologists, criminologists, um, are thinking holistically about the pieces that need to come together to improve the lives of individuals, families, and children. And in my work, um, besides looking at neighborhoods and evaluating programs, I spent a lot of time thinking about prisoner reentry, 20 years at the Urban Institute working with Jeremy Travis, prisoner reentry, what does that mean for individuals and the, and the communities to which individuals return, but I also spend a lot of time thinking about neighborhood disorder and fear of crime. If you have, if you have fearful individuals, are they going to use the neighborhood? Are they going to use the rec center? So in, in thinking about all this, what has struck me is that there has been very little research on the resources and, and the institutions in the community. So I wanted to think about what are positive institutions? Can we quantify that and articulate what these institutions are? So if you think about community organizations, local organizations rooted in the community, they act to increase these networks, these relational networks. They transmit pro-social norms. Um, high capacity institutions provide resources and services that generate collective action. And you're moving towards this phrase, collective efficacy, which leads in the sociological framework towards effective socialization of youth and, and children, which is collective efficacy. And I do want to add, and, and I've done a lot of studies on this, but I won't talk about this. At the same time, it's always important to think about the resources in the community that could be positive, like schools and rec centers, but often act as attractors and generators of, of negative aspects and crime. And I did my dissertation on if schools in urban areas, what types of schools may act to be generators of crime as opposed to places where kids are learning effective socialization. So if that topic comes up, I can talk a little bit about that. But for these studies, I was more um, interested in thinking, can we measure the capacity of institutions and what institutions bring to the community. So I have three main questions, and I worked on an um, Aspen Institute-funded study. Part, I think um, part of the funding came from the Annie Casey Foundation to create a measure of social capital. And I had funding in, I think, 2001, 2002, and I specifically said, okay, how important is the presence of an organization in a neighborhood? Does location matter? Does capacity of that organization matter? So I was thinking, well, we should really have this, this term for organizations called institutional capacity, community institutional capacity. And that consists of, are they there? Are they present? Are the organizations we need there? Are they accessible to residents? And do they have the capacity, the right kind of capacity to serve residents. And I'm not going to talk through the details and the methods of the study, but just quickly think about where an organization is. If you're thinking about accessibility, 
where an organization is. What we did, we, our neighborhoods were, were block groups. We used the census definition of block groups and we plotted all the organizations after lots and lots of research to put together different types of, of organizations and where they are. And then we looked for every neighborhood, how far they were to for a neighborhood, the block edge, what you're seeing there that, that's bolded in that, in that piece of a neighborhood, the lines represent distance to different types of organizations. So can we aggregate that and create a distance measure? So each neighborhood gets a measure of its closeness, its accessibility to organizations. And then there's the idea of capacity, which is a little bit separate um, in and of itself. Is an organization doing multiple types of services? How many individuals they're serving? They've been in the community a long time. They're stable, they have a board of directors, they have a website, people know who they are, what they are. So we did um, a survey of organizations. But first let me just tell you, we spent a lot of time thinking about what institutions are, and we came up with a categorization. Community-based institutions that are really providing services to local residents. And then we have other organizations, they might be national or, or national associations. The National Association of Fraternities, you know, that's not necessarily doing something in the community. Churches and other religious institutions, pro-social places, capture schools, libraries, parks, and rec centers. You have your businesses, your car repair shop, your dry cleaner. And then you have the negative aspects like alcohol outlets. Um, high capacity institutions would fall into just a few of these types. So what we did is we, were, we set out to survey these local residentiary organizations. So I'm going to tell you about the findings from the study. We did the study, small study in southeast Washington, D.C. So I spent most of my years um, at the Urban Institute in D.C. So these studies, unfortunately, are not based in New Jersey, but they have implications for communities everywhere. And then the National Institute of Justice funded a replication of um, the study. So we need to gather information on organizations, gather information about collective efficacy. So we had to survey residents across these neighborhoods and determine whether institutional characteristics of the neighborhood are related to these aspects like collective efficacy and cohesion and control. This is just for anyone who knows DC. We had a small um, set of neighborhoods in the very far southeast and the replication was in and around Capitol Hill. Um, what did we find? If anyone wants to ask me about the methods, we can talk about that later. Well, yes, um, findings. Um, neighborhoods with a greater number of pro-social places. These neighborhoods, the residents had higher block satisfaction, stronger participation in organizations, higher usage, not just, you know, but higher usage in some of the organizations that were in the community. Neighborhoods with greater numbers of religious organizations had higher levels of neighborly exchange. I'll go to my neighbor's house and take the newspapers off the front stoop when they're not home, and or I'll borrow sugar from them and we'll sit and talk about our kids, whatever. Higher levels of trust, block satisfaction, and participation in organizations. We also found that location matters, so that accessibility score. Neighborhoods that had organizations nearby had higher levels of collective efficacy, social control, and, and other um, social capital indicators. Um, the second study also looked at how high capacity neighborhoods did with regard to crime. And so in that second study, we found that greater accessibility, neighborhoods with greater accessibility to organizations had lower rates of aggravated assault. Um, I'll also note that the isolated neighborhoods at the very, in our first study, at the very tip of DC, um, it's segregated by highways and an Air Force base and police training grounds, these neighborhoods were very low on every social capital indicator. So thinking about the position of where neighborhoods are and what that would mean um, for programs. And characteristics, do characteristics matter? Yes, high capacity organizations, high expectations for um, social control in those neighborhoods. Um, high capacity organizations were also, or neighborhoods um, were also neighborhoods with high levels of cohesion and trust among, na among neighbors, and high na neighborhoods with lots of high capacity institutions also had lower aggravated assault rates. So okay, so 
what is a high capacity organization? You haven't seen my survey and all the items there, and I can just quickly tell you that these organizations had large active boards of directors, stable entities in the community, served hundreds of individuals, offered multiple services, and they networked regularly with other community organizations and government agencies. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide to make sure I have time. How am I doing on time? Okay, so I'll, I'll just quickly say, when we looked at businesses, neighborhoods with greater social cohesion were neighborhoods where residents patronized their local businesses, okay? This, this makes sense, but think about the next bullet here, the number of businesses was not associated with patronage. You can't just have car shops and, and dry cleaners and other retail mini markets in your neighborhood. There's got to be, there's something else going in, going on with, with, with neighbors and their neighborly exchange and whether someone's going to use the resources that are in their neighborhood. So just a quick um, wrap up. Organizations do factor, seem to factor from the study into the well-being of communities, presence and distance matters. We also have to think about the different types of organizations, institutions, what are they bringing. I think for fragile families, when you're thinking about programs and situating programs, you know, where are you going to situate them? What does that mean? Um, characteristics of organizations that embody capacity to serve. Capacity is, is really a key indicator. So if we're moving towards thinking about supports for a neighborhood, if, if you are a policymaker, or you're a funder, there's representatives from funding agencies here, you know, what are you thinking about and who you're going to fund? Um, well, what I always say from the researcher side is we really need to know the assets of a community and we have to have them documented. So people can come together and say, we're missing this, or these organizations have the capacity, these don't, should we be working together? You want to overlap, you know, researchers can help overlapping the problem behaviors. Anyone know about the million dollar Murray, one individual who's been incarcerated, used social services, cost the government a million dollars. What, what's happening in these communities? There are an overlap also of problems in places. Does that matter? And what's the capacity, like I just mentioned, of the institutions that are there? We really need a comprehensive understanding of communities to then go in and try to make a dent with new programs. I'm a big advocate, and it's easy for a researcher to say, to utilize research practitioner partnerships. Putting a researcher in to help guide the formation of an evidence-based program or a new innovative program, but also to do evaluation and formative feedback is just critical for communities and increasing the capacity of the organizations that then maybe can follow that lead and do it themselves. And determining which partnerships are needed, if any. You might be able to take a strong model program and situate it in a community. And just quickly, you know, if, the, if this, this dialogue I think we're going to have in the next hour, you know, thinking about there's always a trade-off in how we think about what we're doing in a neighborhood. Are we putting in a comprehensive program? And I know lo lots of implications from the Fragile Families study when you think about what pieces, substantive pieces, need to come together. Are we doing something categorical? We're going to do, we're going to do you know, parenting education, or we're going to do X versus something comprehensive. Do we focus on people versus places, or both? Public sector versus private, and integration of both. Um, leadership of these efforts is key. Deficit oriented, I just on the previous slide, I said figure out what the problems are, you know, the weaknesses. But we spend a lot of time saying we're going to do an asset based approach. We need to do both. We really need to think about what's not there and then use the assets to build that up as well. Capacity building, I'll, I can talk about that forever. And the sustainability of efforts versus the sustainability of organizations. You can put money into, you know, we studied weed and seed years ago, and then weed and seed became safe and drug-free schools. You had to move the target population, you had to move the location of the effort, and the poor people that were focused on in weed and seed were left behind, but it still looked like you had community capacity, but things changed. What does that really mean for sustainability? And then lastly, Program dollars, you're going to invest program dollars, consider how to develop and maintain that capacity of organizations in which program sets. Money can do a heck of a lot, but if it comes in and it leaves, 
Are, are people really thinking about what it means to buoy the supports of that agency and the network of those agencies? Partnerships are great. They can fill the gaps in services. And I'm going to say something that a lot of people might not believe. They can be done without funding. And some of the most successful partnerships I have seen have been done without fun funding. Talk about sustainability and maintenance. People don't get burned out. You do it without money. And lastly, program dollars geared toward partnerships should fund, you know, the funders out there, you got to have flexibility in funding so someone can fund a, par a, a leader position to draw the people together, get everyone mo motivated, and be thinking about sustainability at the same time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Is it good afternoon yet, or is it still good morning? Uh, thank you, Wanda, for inviting me, Lauren, for putting this together, and to my colleagues at our sister Rucker Schools for coordinating this. Um, I am probably going to diverge a little bit from some of my esteemed colleagues on how I approach this topic. Um, one of the things that appealed to me greatly is when Lauren and I were talking about this is um, I am going to talk a lot about the importance of data-driven policy making and the absolute critical role that researchers must play in these partnerships, echoing what Katarina said, in being part of policy making processes. Um, having been a traditional academic, I've enjoyed publishing tomes that sit on people's desks and, and uh, uh, files, but really have had no impact on really generating new policy discourse <coughs> or really listening to a lot of researchers are doing. And I think it's becoming, um, I don't want to say, a, a, maybe an ethical issue for a lot of us, uh, a lot of researchers who are university-based researchers, because what's happening in, um, in the void where we are not doing this type of work is you have for-profit uh, research consulting groups stepping in, uh, billing uh, millions of dollars to do static reports um, from data dumps. That really is a waste of your time, funders' money. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about an alternative of, of approaching this by presenting a current project that my research group is working on. Essentially, for the last several years, we've been doing uh, evaluation research directly with policymakers, um, a lot of it funded by the Nicholson Foundation. And the Nicholson Foundation has made it very clear that they are not interested in research that is just a static report. They want research that is done in conjunction with policymakers that is going to have a sustainable impact on that particular area. So we've done a lot of work in the area of reentry policy and education policy. So in, part, in, in kind of setting the stage for this. I will talk a little bit about the issue and the research we're doing, but one of the things that we have become very interested in working on is urban education, the dropout crisis, that's a phenomenon that's existing across urban areas, and working with policymakers on seeing that the research that we've been, our research group has been doing is in conjunction with Newark Public Schools. In fact, it is with Newark Public Schools. We sit at Newark Public Schools. And there's a couple um, advantages to this, and it might make some organizations a little nervous about this, giving researchers access to your data. And I'm not talking, here's an Excel file that um, we've extracted with information we want you to see. I'm talking about sharing with us what is really going on in your organization so we can then really look at it we don't have publication goals. We're really invested and then giving you an appropriate analysis based upon that data. Well, we were able to achieve that with Newark Public Schools. We have their data. And part of this is a, it's a relationship that we, we have built through being embedded. I used that word earlier and someone made a comment about, you know, guns embedded. It's a different type of gun in Newark Public School. But it's that relationship. And this is something that I think researchers, university-based researchers, need to develop more which is research that is designed to be implemented. Not research because we have our own research idea and we're going to apply for a $40,000 grant. It's research that's it's costly, but it's research that provides us as consultants and researchers to the policymakers. So I want to frame it in that context. Um, so, Newark, New Jersey. 
Um, you can read the statistics up there. It is a city, like many urban districts, that has a very high dropout rate. Now, I've got a range here because uh, previous administrations, and I've now survived, I guess, three superintendents in North Public Schools. Uh, previous administrations uh, used to report that 90% of their students graduated in Newark. Um, when we have now recalculated based upon more reasonable estimates, we're now down to 53, approximately. But one of the travesties of this, and it's something that Irv talked about earlier, is that there is almost a pipeline between dropping out of high school and school and becoming incarcerated. Okay? There's also a, an interesting uh, pregnancy and then dropping out of school. So these are two, when he talks about preventative measures, I would clearly argue that these are two issues very important in dealing with our urban youth. So we have a very high, uh, we have um, a very high percentage of um, residents who are at the poverty level or below poverty level in Newark. Interesting statistics, um, we have a very high percentage of our Newark public school students go on to Essex County College, but the majority of them do not pass the necessary entrance exam. So they're stuck in remediation, which then results in them using up all of their uh, financial aid for remedial courses that do not count as college credits. They drop out, they have nothing going forward. So these are just a couple, um, I'm not sure if the colors are coming out. These are city school schools in need of improvement and you can see that there's a lot of schools that are in need of improvement that we've overlaid with by census block. Now just so you know, everything here that's being presented has been done for Newark Public Schools. Uh, we're working very closely with the governor's transition team in the city. And these, these things are not done for us. This is done because this data is being used by um, policymakers as they're generating and deciding about the new schools. Again, we looked at proficiency levels and language arts scores. Um, you have a huge percentage that are scoring at very high levels um, uh, beneath the, the average proficiency level. And again, we have in the math and JASC as well. So we have students that there's a high dropout rate. Students who are at the schools are not doing a great job while they're in schools. They're graduating clearly with not um, a level of proficiency they should. And just another shocking um, number is that they have to develop a new school to deal with students who did not fit in with a lot of alternative programs because of their reading level. These are overage high school students. Someone throw out a guess on what reading level these overage high school students have. 2.9. 2.9. Because a lot of the programs, you had to have a sixth grade reading level in high school. These had under a third grade reading level. So there's been a lot of different efforts, and we've been working with Newark Public Schools and Nicholson Foundation and looking at these different models, identifying things that work in the models, helping them um, develop new models. They had this Office of Alternative Education that was opened. And then a few years later was something called the YES Center, the Youth Employment Education Success Center. And this was specifically developed to bring at-risk or formerly dropped out students back into the education. This is being done for a variety of reasons. First of all, students who were a certain age, let's say they're 18, they feel like too old to go to high school, they go do a GED. GED, the type of support you get for that, coming to a school district, is in the hundreds. The type of support you do if you bring that kid back into high school is 20-some thousand. So there's also an economic uh, incentive. One of the first academic programs that wasn't officially a high school because the students couldn't graduate from this high school was something called the Newark Workforce Development Institute. This was designed to respond to the fact that so many of our students need to work. They cannot afford to go to school because they're supporting their families. So one of the issues in this dropout is identifying why are these kids not going to school? Well, they have to work. Okay, they're starting to come, but some are not coming regularly because they have children. So a childcare facility was established so they could have the kids drop off their children. 2008 and 2009, some of the Gates models that have been uh, known across the nation were implemented. And we developed a, um, essentially an, uh, a credit recovery program that we were able, working with New York Public Schools, identifying students that um, only needed a couple credits to graduate, but if they didn't complete those credits, they essentially would have been a dropout because they would not have gotten their degree. 2009 and 10, we had additional models that were implemented, okay, this past year. And then we had another credit recovery pilot for 12th graders. Um, very successful, this is something also that, and I will get to why some of this is happening, is that there are students who are dropping out even though they were over-credited 
seems kind of strange. A lot of students were not getting counseling on the pro classes they needed to take to graduate. So you might have a student with 20, 25 credits over what they need who are finally dropping out because they're like a third year senior and they're done. They need to go to work. Okay. <coughs> Last year, MPS received a variety of several state improvement grants, and that's when we fast track Success Academy to deal with students at the 2.9 grade level and the Newark Innovation Academy. Several new schools, if you've been reading the papers, you have part of the story, are going to be opened up in this coming school year. Now, you probably have all heard about the Facebook money coming to Newark. Very interesting. Um, a lot of politics involved, can't talk in too much detail about what's going on. Suffice to say that there's been a significant match from that money. And then the decision is what do we do with this money? What is it that Newark Public Schools needs? Now you only have so many months to make a decision on this. Clearly we want school choice, smaller schools. There's interest, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Chicago system, in doing portfolio management which requires constant feedback on what's working and what's not working. Change in length of school day and school. Um, year, well, shocking that we might actually have our kids go to school the month of July and might have them go longer and longer hours. But the goal is to shift in accountability to measure teachers on student performance, which I do not advocate is necessarily what the governor's stipulating, um, and consolidation of schools and co location. Finally, revised civil service. There's reasons for that. There's a promotion system currently where people are put in positions that can't do the jobs and other people are having to be hired to do the jobs they can't do, so it's not very efficient. So, part of where all of this comes from is that Newark Public Schools has been operating, as most urban districts, without any policy making that is driven by actual data. They don't actually know who their students are, what their students need, why they're dropping out at this school but succeeding in this school. What are the specific, what are the specific issues that are causing student X to fail but student Y to succeed? We know that high mobility rates, um, connection with social services, homelessness, drugs, all of these factors play into these issues, but we don't know specifically the trajectories and trends. So part of what's happening across the nation is there are these segmentation analyses that are happening. Some districts just to look at at-risk students, others to really look, how do we serve our students? We cannot use a suburban template, which is, this is the school model, these are the programs, this is the school work for everyone. It doesn't work in these districts. So we're going to be replicating this for Newark Public Schools on how we have their data. So we're working with them very closely on identifying their students who are Newark Public School students. But not just the at-risk students, we're looking at all students in the district. From that, we're going to be able to look at graduation rates, compare them across district programs. Are these new models working? Are they not? Again, new school models have been developed with the assumption that Newark needs these school models. But we, don't, we, we need to have more information on that. The goal is to develop an at-risk measure where we can start getting our district to be able to identify when these students are falling off track. And we're starting pending other data that's available, preschool. All right, we already know we're doing middle school through high school because middle school is critical, but we really want to look at what's happening with students who've gone through preschool, through graduation, and then on, post-secondary. We want to also monitor and evaluate the different, the different strategies that have been developed to deal with different student populations. We want to link student outcomes with financial outlays. One of the other things we're working on is we're mapping every funding dollar that has come to Newark Public Schools from state, federal, local, whatever you can imagine. Where is the money coming from? Where has it gone and what has it done? We want to look at teacher performance measures. We're fully aware of the different environmental factors that teachers deal with. We want to see how are teachers, a lot of qualitative information coming into this. We're going to be recommending programmatic intervention. And the ultimate goal is that when we leave, Newark Public Schools will have the ability of generating these types of reports and using this data so they can have effective policy making going on. That they don't need external researchers to be helping with it. They will have this capacity. And, and this is called the multiple pathways to graduation, which is probably the big buzzword you heard, which is the idea that there's multiple pathways that students can take to graduate from high school. So again, the reason that this is going to be successful is that we are working directly with Newark Public Schools. 
The research we're doing is for them, not for us. It's not for our funder. It is for Newark Public Schools. So ending on that note, I um, hope I haven't upset any traditional academics. Thank you. What role is what? Parents. Parents. Um, parents are being surveyed. Um, there has been just, there's data that's being collected from the data systems, but in addition to that, starting sometime next year, there's a qualitative survey that's going to be going out to um, all students and parents to ascertain their feelings on what's going on in the district or their goals for their students. Um, with regard to um, direct parental involvement in the district, there are some other programs that are being developed. Um, I know I don't know if you're familiar, there was already a survey done of parents that had a bit of um, publicity around it um, called the Penn Newark uh, Report. I know that there has been attempts to kind of modify that, although the initial um, a summary of that report is that parents' feelings about the district are somewhat what we all expected, that they're looking for more accountability, they're looking for um, more choice for their students. So parents have been surveyed to get their uh, input on this initial kind of program design that's happening. But most of what we're looking at, and when we get into the more socio-behavioral, that's other indicators we're going to be adding into our analysis that will involve parents as well. <coughs> This is for Dr. Roman. Dr. Ron Kanan of the University of Pennsylvania yeah. has done great research yeah. on economic evaluation of um, the proper organizations, especially faith based organizations. Yeah. So, you, how have you integrated his work? Uh, his work is wonderful and is so needed. And I guess you know that he looked at, he and um, Beverly Frazier together looked at just in general what was out there for returning prisoners in Philadelphia. And, and he has thought long and hard about um, capacity building for faith-based organizations. And that is a, a particular interest with me. And, and when I set out to do this study, because we have heard anecdotally forever the amount of, of advocacy work and individual level work that faith-based partners do, whether it's prisoner reentry or mentoring kids, so we set out to do a separate survey in the second study, a separate survey of faith-based organizations um, to get an understanding how rooted are they in the community and, and does it matter how rooted they are in the community? Because in, in Washington, D.C., I mean, it's probably very similar here with, with um, New Jersey and, and Pennsylvania being you know, just right, a, right across the bridge. So in, in D.C., there are a lot of churches that exist now where individuals from Maryland will come in and go to those churches that are in D.C. And it might be, we don't know this, but I've anecdotally heard that it might be less likely that some churches do a lot of local services. They, they may mentor youth somewhere else, but they might not necessarily be focused on the area around their church. So we set out to get a better understanding of uh, and a, a way to document the strengths of churches. And in me getting all excited to do this research, when we, when we surveyed the churches in our first smaller study in Southeast, we got pretty good response, but we didn't ask a lot of individual, we were almost afraid to ask these questions of what percent of your congregation is from the area. Um, we decided to have a separate survey for our second study, and we couldn't get a big response from the churches. We had about 200 um, big churches on our list and another 100 storefront churches, and our response rate after, I can't even tell you how many hours we spent knocking on doors and doing follow-up, our response rate was less than 30%. So the, 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 to be able to answer the questions, and I don't know if this is what your question is getting at, to be able to answer those questions from a resource standpoint. What, if you can't do it with the larger surveys, and Dr. Kanan has been able to do that, but his surveys haven't necessarily asked some of the questions about the locally embedded focus and, and that those supports. It's been more of a macro level. What do these congregations do? So the focus is not on serving the local community. That's my interest. We haven't been able to do that in any type of larger, more macro look in neighborhoods. 
The work that's being done is more qualitative, going in and interviewing ministers and pastors and, and, and leaders of religious organizations to get some sense of what they're doing. So I view Dr. Kanan's work as a huge compliment. I mean, it needs to be done to understand how many programs out there are run by faith-based agencies. Do they have the capacity? And then we start to get more micro and looking at what does that mean for the local neighborhood. <coughs> Uh, I have two somewhat uh, related questions. One has to do with the perception of neighborhood by the residents and perception of resource by the residents. You use census tract data to define essentially your neighborhoods, and we know, we know, a variety of research, that th that doesn't line up with how people define their own neighborhood, who they relate to. <coughs> So I wonder how that affected your research and, and looking at, let me just put the second one on the table, and that is, it seems to me, I mean, essentially the research is correlational. Um, yeah. And that people place resources where they think they can survive. So it's a chicken and egg question. Are the resources there because the people who put the resources there who run those organizations think it's viable? Um, or uh, does it, you're essentially suggesting that uh, there's some, or looting, I don't think you'd ever suggest there was a causal relationship, uh, that because you have the resources, you have these results. And, and it might just be that you have poor outcomes, and as a result, the resources don't move into those neighborhoods because they're not viable. We answer your second question first. So there are many things that we found from the study that would have no bearing on that our data weren't longitudinal. Like if a rec center is there, people use it. Doesn't matter if it's been there for 50 years. In that time when that rec, rec center is there, are people going to use it? And then if they're not using it, why or why not? It doesn't matter five years ago, one year, what they're doing in the future. So there are many implications that come from the cross-sectional work. We have tried, and I'm going to jump around a little, we tried to take a longitudinal look at who's, what neighborhood organizations have been in there, who's been in there getting the data. It's very difficult to, thousands of dollars, I mean tens of thousands of dollars I would say, to just create a, a longitudinal look at what institutions have been there. So I think we all know how difficult that, that is to do. So I even attempted to do it, and we did not see when we looked at the, the databases the done in Bradstreet data and tax return data for organizations and all that data over a five year period, it actually didn't change much. And it, it makes you wary a little bit overall about how valid that data the data are. So that's a, your point there. But we spent a lot of time validating, validating the data for in that second study in 2005 just to remove organizations that might have said, you know, I'm going to locate at 300 Pennsylvania Avenue and that's where the organization is and then we called and called and called and they don't do anything at that, that address. So that, I, can, I can talk about that all day. But I think the point is, this is a starting point. I think in, in, in 2000, 2001, Aspen in, Institute funded the study because it's very rare that research on the, larger, on the larger level looks across neighborhoods and says what is there in every level. You, if you look in the academic literature, you can find a study on rec centers, you can find a study on ho hospitals and access to hospitals, you can find a study on access to healthy foods. But can, you, can, you, can you take it all together and think about what it means? We're just trying to push the envelope forward a little. That's question two. Question one on, on, on methods. Can you remind me what that was? Uh, oh, yes, the block. The neighborhood yeah. definition of a block. So in our methods, in, in operationalizing accessibility, when I showed that picture of the block route and accessibility, so even though we define the neighborhood as a block route, for the measurement, for any of the organization measures, had to do with a larger catchment area. We, we, we looked at three ways to define a neighborhood. So an organization, let's say it's in the census block, it's in a quarter mile buffer, and it's in a half mile buffer. And we ran analyses all different ways to look at what does there there mean? What does being in the neighborhood mean to see if it matters at all? And there were some differences. And I can send you a copy of the report if, 
you were interested in, in talking about those. But you're right, the, the biggest limitation is from the collective efficacy side and the measuring social capital side, we needed some definition of, of neighborhoods that was then going to jive with some of the other census indicators we, we have. And that really led, it's in, in the criminological literature, it's important to always control for racial heterogeneity and, and residential stability and stability. And we needed those measures. And we weren't surveying. We did with the few, if I told you what, how much money we had to do this first study, it, it's almost unbelievable that we got the responses that we did. But we surveyed in the block groups. We made sure that we got roughly 30 households from every block group. If we were going to do something where we were defining neighborhoods or even doing, we did do some field work ahead to get some sense of our people thinking that these are their neighborhoods and there was somewhat of a match. It was just, we, we didn't have the power or the resources to set out and say, let's define neighborhoods and then let's go back and do our study that way. But what I'm saying really is the, is the statistical methods and the definitional methods we took into consideration should mitigate some of those problems. Right, and I, I, I say this and it's not to criticize the research. I think it, it really is groundbreaking what you're doing, so I want to compliment you on that. The other, I mean, I guess I raise the question of neighborhood definition. There's also gang territory issues of kids not crossing a street within the census block because it's uh, overseen by another gang. It's gang territory. There's big issues of turf, as you know. In terms of resources, though, there is, as you may know, a uh, technique called um, youth, uh, youth mapping, mm -hmm. which for youth, they essentially go block by block and define what they believe are the resources. And you get a very different picture of what resources are from the youth's perspective as you do if you look at the institutional resources as you did. So I think yes. it would be important to look at that as a compliment. And we, well, that's one of the things we would have loved to do, have, to have been able to get the youth perspective on utilizing service. You know, are you going to the rec center? We asked the parent, you know, are you going to the rec center? Are you going to the community center? We didn't ask the kids. We didn't get the kids' sense of that. But, uh, you know, an interesting thing, the whole gang idea is, is very fascinating to me. So I did a separate study to um, delineate gang set spaces all throughout DC. It was Project Safe Neighborhoods funding. So we, I have a shape file that looks at where the gangs are and what people will do. And I have another published study looking at fear of crime. Do people walk in their neighborhood given there's gang set spaces nearby? So we're, we're thinking about that and really trying to think about where, where is the school? I want that data. Well, I would love to have that data. In DC and in Philadelphia, it's very difficult to, to think, to get a hold of data that shows where the kid lives and where he goes to school. Because think about it, it's not a boundary, it's not a school boundary focused city. It's really hard to do good research in that area, but we're, we're trying to move toward that. Okay, we're going to take one more question and then we're going to open it up to our third panel. I'll be quick. Uh, I'm going to of my book. And I wanted to well, thank you for doing the research on Google schools because I think it's really required. We, after a lot of effort with support from the AGC, we finally got into some of the Google public schools. We are providing much needed mental health and behavioral health services. And um, one of the things that we have come across in the last few years of working with six or seven schools, and there's a huge need that we are getting more requests from schools every other week, is um, lack of social workers who are trained in mental health. And secondly, lack of training for the teachers to identify those mental health and family crisis issues before the crisis actually hits the kid. So, you know, there's a downfall from there. So, um, you know, just as an advocate for the kids that we are working for, if I would just encourage that in your research, if I don't know if you already have it, but a mental health piece for the teachers and the students and like social workers. And you know, I think uh, on behalf of the New World community, I think the nonprofit organizations who are in mental health would be willing to help with the research that they're doing for the outcomes of the graduation. Because some of the kids we have worked with, we did a follow-up with them. And um, for example, one was a cutter. Now she's graduating, and she's doing so much better. So. I completely agree with you, and, and actually we've tried to conceive of every type of uh, uh, 
health, behavioral, social, any type of variable that could uh, impact students. And again, one of the goals at the end of this research is to be able to make um, uh, informed decisions on the type of strategies and recommendations. Um, it is interesting, um, one point though, uh, New York Public Schools has about eight different data systems, and one of the things we're working on is integrating them. Um, it is actually something significant that a teacher does not know that she has a student in her classroom that it could be homeless who's um, been taken from their family in a diaper situation. The rationale has been for a long time that this could be used uh, by the teacher to maybe judge the students. So what we're in the process of doing is a lot of information, like pregnancies. There is actually in the student data system, I mean, test score data is not kept with attendance data. So one of the things we're doing is merging data systems, and then the information you have would be kept in a field, hand no, there's no like checked off box. So it requires literally going through thousands and thousands of records and seeing is there a notation. But if you're engaged, we most likely will be crossing paths in the next year um, to talk to you about the students and, and who needs it. And that's, the, that's actually the second stage of this analysis is the first is all the academic data, um, behavior, more reco easily recorded, easily recorded data that may or not be valuable. Um, we have to clean a lot of the data. Um, the second step is going to the different agencies who are already engaged, which is one of the reasons we're looking at programs, seeing who's engaged, to work with them and making sure we have identified all students who might have mental health issues or other issues. Because it's, it's not reported, it's not, it's not recorded the way you think it would be right. in the district. Okay, so thank you to this panel, and you will stay put. And, um, <laughs> and Elise Jet, I'm going to mispronounce your name. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I get the, the you know, bad score for you today, so come on down. Jia Ivo, is that children 
and play a positive role in the direction of the community and giving back to the community. Uh, in the three years that we've been operating, we've graduated about 299 men from the program. Uh, earlier last year, when we were doing well with employment, we had about a 70% employment rate. It's down now to about 43%. Everyone, you know, tells me that the economy is doing better, but uh, I'm still waiting for it to knock on my door, or knock on yours door. It's not just it hasn't quite gotten back to where we need it to be. Um, we're also sending men to school. We have a great partnership with Essex County College, and our facility is located in Essex County College. So about uh, 12 of our men have gone on to uh, enroll in Essex County College. We have about 40 men that are currently working on GED uh, preparation, getting ready to secure their GEDs. And uh, the remaining men we have are, are waiting for employment. We also have a great relationship uh, with the Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor. Uh, where they're helping assist men with going back to school to pick up vocational trades, and such as uh, trucking, construction, electricity, uh, and things of that nature. Once men graduate from our program, uh, they become part of our alumni association. And we have monthly alumni programs that act as sort of a uh, support center for men. Uh, uh, being a father, being a man, I know sometimes it's difficult for men to express their feelings, and it, it, it sometimes turns into many of the issues that we see in the streets with crime, and uh, many of the issues that we see with domestic violence, and, and social issues that we see with children, and the disconnection between children and father. So I think we provide the opportunity for men to one, express themselves, uh, talk in a safe surrounding uh, atmosphere that is conducive to some of the needs that, that they have, and some of the issues that they're going through. One of the uh, most surprising things that I learned uh, while working with, with uh, this group of men is sometimes these, these men think they're isolated in their issues and that they're only the only person in the world going through those issues. So for me it was very uh, revealing that, you know, once you get a men, uh, room full of men, they're kind of shocked to see that, you know, we could fill up from the sides of this room with men going through the same exact issues as, as themselves. We also uh, offer legal uh, assistance for men that are having issues uh, with child support as a uh, the, the former pre presenter said, you know, in the state of New Jersey, child support doesn't stop because you're incarcerated. So what we see is men at home uh, with child support balances uh, out of the highest I've seen is about $93,000. Uh, and we're talking about men with little to no education at all, little to no employment history at all, and the, the average salary they're probably going to make is between $12 and $15 an hour. So if you have a balance of about $90,000, to $100,000, balance of your head and the government is, is uh, able to take a significant portion of that if you are behind in child support, it, because it causes issues. Uh, so we have uh, uh, legal representation for some of our men uh, when it's quali when they need it and when, when they qualify for it uh, to represent men in court to have child support modifications. Uh, not uh, uh, asking the judge to forgive the balance, but uh, by asking for a situation uh, where it's fair. I've, I've met with many men and, you know, they bring home checks that, that are about $20, $30 at the end of, you know, child support and some of the obligations they have to pay off. So some of the things that, that I think the state and the courts uh, have to recognize is that, you know, as, as these individuals are trying to get themselves back into society, they still have the bills that everyone else has. They, they have rent, they have uh, food obligations, electricity, gas, all those sort of bills. So certainly uh, you don't want to handicap an individual anymore um, than some of the self-inflicted uh, issues that they have caused upon themselves. Uh, another uh, program that we operate and manage is the Family Success Centers. Uh, Newark now uh, manages three of them. There are 15 in the city of Newark. Uh, we also manage on behalf of the State Department of Child and Families the network of Family Success uh, Centers throughout the city. Family Success Centers are essentially one-stop shops for uh, resources for families. And the model uh, was replicated from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And what we find is if you co-locate services where the people live at uh, within their communities, then nine times out of 10, they're gonna take advantage of those services and, and use them for, for, their, for their benefits. So uh, at our family success centers, we connect folks with uh, government benefits, cash assistance, food stamps, uh, rental assistance, healthcare assistance, uh, educational assistance in some uh, cases, and whatever needs that they essentially have. And I think the, uh, the, the part that makes our Family Success Centers unique is we use folks from the community. 
So we have uh, three, and one is located in Bradley Court, which is public housing within the city of Newark. Uh, there's another in Georgia King Village, which is low income subsidized housing. And we have one also in Essex County College to reach the college population. Uh, at Bradley Court, our coordinator of that site is actually a resident of the community. Uh, she lives in Bradley Court, so she knows the needs that, that most of the residents within that community need. Uh, they feel comfortable going to our Family Success Center because it's a familiar face. And, and one of our models is who better to serve you than those who know you. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, for me, I, I, I never lived in public housing. I don't currently live in public housing. But it, it would be odd for me to be able to give advice to someone that does and, and maybe has a generational history of living in public housing. So for us, that, that, that model works and it, it's conducive to what we, uh, some of the challenges that we face throughout the city. Uh, that's, that's about it for Newark. I'm going to stand Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I really want to applaud the, uh, the work that's been going on uh, on fragile families. I think it's so significant. Um, and I really want to thank the Attorney General's Office and Mondo for putting together these wonderful forums. I think it's been a tremendous we, a round of applause. I think they've done a great job. I want to, I'm, I'm the President and CEO of the Center for Family Services in Camden, New Jersey, Southern New Jersey. And, uh, uh, you know, talking about the macro level issues, so important. Uh, but I was asked a little bit to talk about really some of the uh, micro level issues and services. I, I wanted to first tell you a little story, and maybe many of you have heard this story, but I think it's important because when we can get overwhelmed by the macro level issues, by you know, how, how do we change these issues of poverty and the issue of kids not graduating high school and all, and all these broad issues, and we must, must make policy changes. But every day we're faced with people who need help. And, um, there's a story, and I tell my staff this, uh, I have in the past, about uh, a boy and a starfish. Do you know the story? Some of you may know. But let me tell the story. So I want you to imagine a beach, and it's a sunny day, and, and the beach is covered with starfish. And one day a man was walking down the beach, taking notice that the beach was covered with all these starfish. And he was walking along, and he noticed a boy picking something up and gently throwing it into the ocean. And he approached the boy and he said, what are you doing? And the youth replied, I'm throwing starfish back into the ocean. The surf is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they will die. Son, the man said, don't you realize there are miles and miles in, of beach and thousands of starfish? You can't possibly make a difference. And listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish, and he threw it back into the ocean. And then smiling at the man, he said, I made a difference for that one. And that's how I think we have to approach our work. We have to continue to help the people that are struggling and disadvantaged as we try to impact social policy and public opinion about how do we solve some social problems. A few words about the Center for Family Services. We are a multi-service family service organization, and we've grown, uh, the organization goes back to 1920, but we've really grown in the last, uh, last 10 years. Uh, we now have a staff of over 500 people, 20 locations, and 45 programs helping children and families. And I've been with the organization in my 30th year, believe it or not, I started when I was 15, but, so. <laughs> Uh, and we, we are headquartered in Camden, although we deal with southern New Jersey, but uh, our, our focus really is Camden, uh, large emphasis on Camden City. And we see our work as providing vision, hope, and strength to individuals and families who are struggling. So people come to us at a time of, in crisis. Their family is falling apart, they may lose their children, they've been sexually assaulted, they've been a victim of domestic violence, they're dealing with substance abuse and mental health issues. So, difficult work. And so we cluster our services, children and family work, behavioral health, substance abuse, victim services, and safe and supportive housing. Uh, and, and I think one of our successes has been this holistic, integrative approach to dealing with the family. You know, we're somewhat you know, isolated in how we look at social problems, 
And I think that sometimes does a disservice to, to families and all the issues they face. And most of our work is with fragile families. When I look at the uh, information that's been presented, these are uh, single moms, low income, limited education, dads, and, and significant others marginally involved with addiction issues, domestic violence, mental health, disadvantage. Some of these families have been disadvantaged since day one. And, but our work is family focused. We do believe that the family is the point of intervention, that it is the most important institution in our society, that children do better when they come from strong, stable families, that children need at least one person who truly cares about them, who is emotionally invested in them. Of course, if two or more, certainly better. We do need a village. How do we expect kids to succeed when their basic needs aren't being met, whether it's housing, health, education, and children need consistent parenting. And we believe in the importance of fathers and involving and engaging men. Uh, but we also know that parenting is hard. I, I'm a parent, many of you have been parents. It is not easy, and there are many challenges. And we're, we're impressed every day with the resiliency in the people that we see and in the strengths that they have. Most parents do truly care about their children and want to be good parents, but these external stressors just become overwhelming. So over 30 years, we've built a continuum of service uh, to families to help in our interventions, to help them access resources, to improve their own education and employability, to deal with the mental health issues, the depression, domestic violence, substance abuse issues. And so we, we have a, a continuum of services and relationship issues as well. It starts with concrete services to case management services to clinical work and family therapy <coughs> interventions. And services are provided in our offices, in homes. Many of our services are in the client's home and in uh, community settings like schools. And we've partnered with uh, and been funded by all the state departments, the Department of Children and Families, and, and uh, all, all the other state departments. So just a few words on a few programs that we do and, and why I think they're so important. 35 years ago, we started a, a parent aid program with the state of New Jersey called Treatment Alternatives for Children at Risk. The goal was to prevent the out-of-home placement of children, keep children with their families. It's very disruptive for a child family for the children to go into foster care. So we, we hired actually people from the community, successful women who were good parents, and they became mentors. And most of them are still with us 20 some years later, uh, providing service to help families with basic concrete skills, parenting skills, parent education, how do you manage a dollar, how can you access resources, and, and what can we do to help keep your family together. Over the years, some of you may know some of these programs, we, be, we began a Healthy Families program, which is an evidence-based program from Hawaii, which helps us, we work with teen moms and first-time mothers who are at risk, and with a, a sort of case management, a curriculum around parenting children, age-appropriate expectations of children, what can we do to help you to become employed? We can follow, and we follow these young women for five years around relationship issues, some of the things that were talked about today. How do you make good choices in your relationships? We do a program called Multisystemic Therapy. Somebody was asking about that, which is an evidence-based program that uh, really works with adolescents, conduct disorder kids, and their families. And again, it's a family therapy program, a cognitive behavioral best practice program to try to uh, keep kids out of the correctional system. So prevention uh, as well as treatment. We are, uh, a few years ago, began a major project with the community partners, and some of them are here today, uh, from CPAC, the Hispanic Family Center, called Differential Response, which is a program that tries to keep, again, children out of the DIFAS system. Uh, a lot of kids get into the system because they just have basic concrete needs. They end up, and we can prevent and help with housing, help with some concrete things, help with some parenting issues and support, and be a surrogate parent sometimes to some of these parents who, who are struggling so hard. And focused on that is our Covenant for Children in Camden County, where we're, we are trying to bring together all the players and partners to work on really improving child well-being in the county of Camden. In, in recent years, we've added Family Connect, an evidence-based program at the University of, America, uh, University of Maryland that works with families with a medically fragile child. And again, we're in the home 
helping the parent to deal with the sick child? How can we, again, prevent uh, further deterioration of family because of the stress that these issues place? So what, what is, I could go on and on. We, we do 10 others that deal with substance abuse and uh, you know, delinquent kids and, uh, and our TANF initiative for parents as well, where parents can come and, and do a parenting enrichment program rather than a, uh, an educational uh, or work uh, employability. What's the good news in all this? We have great success in our programs. The outcomes are all positive. Many of these programs are evidence-based. They've been proven to work. Uh, we've, they've been researched. They are effective. And we follow the curriculums. And our human service technology, I think, and the good news is that in the 30 years that things have changed, we have really improved our technology. We, we do know what works. We do know what helps children and families. And uh, the problem is we don't have enough of them. Right? And the problem is we have too many uh, other extenuating factors like socioeconomics and education, other things that impact families. I just want to tell you about our, our new, uh, new project that actually um, I think is very critical, and many of you have probably heard of it. Um, two minutes, okay. Uh, the, uh, we are working with, uh, in fact, the Attorney General's office gave us a planning grant to try to institute and replicate uh, a promised neighborhood of Canada City. You're all familiar with Jeffrey Canada's work in New York City that does what we do. We do it all over the place, but he, he's done it at scale in a community, right? Baby college to college for every kid and family in a neighborhood. I mean, that's, and reverse the cycles of poverty, improve academic success, and really make people self-sufficient. I, I guess in, in and finalizing this, I just want to say, I think we have a responsibility to get the word out to the broader community. You know, you all probably believe in all these things, but the general community doesn't understand it, right? They think these, everyone needs to pull themselves up from their bootstraps, that if you're not doing it, something's wrong with you, that uh, this individual responsibility. We, we really have to pay, people are disadvantaged, they need additional help. People want to succeed. We, we have to work together to equalize opportunity uh, for everybody to break, uh, break these cycles. And I think the family is, is the place to, to really put our efforts and interviews. Thank you very much. Hi, I um, am very thankful for the opportunity to be here today, both to share and to learn. Um, for the past nine months, I have been uh, serving the country as an AmeriCorps VISTA and coordinating New Jersey's Amachi Break the Cycle program. Amachi Break the Cycle's mission is to match children of prisoners with community mentors. By looking at the staggering statistics and numbers, we'll see that this is no small task. According to the Department of Corrections, about 62,000 New Jersey children have one or more parent in prison. Children experience their parents' incarceration as a loss, a loss similar to that a child might feel when they lose a parent to illness. They feel abandoned and they often feel at fault. Visiting is stressful and scary and witnessing the arrest of a parent is traumatizing. Couple loss, trauma, guilt and instability with poverty and an environment of crime and you have the seeds of a vicious cycle. These children's lives are written about and spoken of using ominous vocabulary and language. Children of prisoners are referred to as the invisible population, the next generation of prisoners, collateral damage, and included as part of a vicious intergenerational cycle. Research seems to imply that these children are more likely than their peers to become involved in drug and alcohol abuse, drop out of school, and or become offenders themselves. Just saying these sentences makes me feel discouraged and overwhelmed. I am, however, buoyed by the body of research that demonstrates the efficacy of mentoring. According to a Family and Corrections Network report, mentoring programs for children of prisoners have been proven to improve children's socio-emotional skills, increase their capacity for attachments, and produce stronger, healthier relationships between children and others leading to better outcomes in social and academic competence. Mentoring also benefits the, the community 
by fostering and encouraging volunteerism, understanding, and tolerance. When I started with AmeriCorps in August 2010, I was really excited to begin fighting the war on poverty and to start making a difference. Quickly, I discovered that my enthusiasm was no match for some of the structural and funding barriers we would face. In 2008, the Northwestern New Jersey Community Action Program ambitiously hoped to begin a statewide mentoring program for children of prisoners. They were going to model this after the Amachi Project. The Amachi Project was founded in 2001 in Philadelphia by public and private ventures and the former mayor, Dr. Reverend Good. The Northwestern New Jersey Community Action Program received funding from the Nicholson Foundation and was approved for an AmeriCorps VISTA grant from the Corporation for National Community Service. The program was to be sponsored by New Jersey's Retired Senior Volunteer Program. When I began my term, there were nine vistas covering 12 of New Jersey's counties. Today, we are down to five counties and five vistas. When the project began in 2008, it was really little more than an idea. There was no social worker, no policies or procedures, and no established partnerships. In the two years before I came on board, the vistas who preceded me did an enormous amount of work on capacity building and partnerships. They established memorandums of understanding which required that VISTAs be responsible for identifying children of prisoners and recruiting mentors in each organization's respective counties. In return, the organizations would be responsible for facilitating the match process and supervision. Some of these organizations included Big Brothers Big Sisters, the Boys and Girls Club, Catholic Charities, and Mentoring Plus. The VISTAs established positive relationships with these organizations acting as recruiting arms, but unfortunately there was a good deal of disconnect. Additionally, a lack of interest from several of the retired senior volunteer programs that were meant to sponsor and sustain the program made progress difficult and eventually the program was pulled from all but five counties. The project remains active in Passaic, Conradin, Morris, Warren, and Sussex counties. Our current partner, Just One Mentoring, is a brand new community-based project that aims to pair children of prisoners who are ages four to 18 with positive role models. <coughs> Mentors spend an hour per week for at least one year with their mentee engaging in recreational activities, attending events, or helping with homework. We've been helping them build their program since April, and after this week, I'll be able to happily say that the first two matches have been made. Unfortunately, Just One will be losing all of its federal funding on October 1st. As we look for new funding avenues, I'm encouraged by the attention that Amashi Break the Cycle has already brought to this population. One of the most positive outcomes of this project has been making an invisible population's needs visible. In the short few months that we had access to Edmund Mann Prison, which is New Jersey's only women's prison, we identified 72 children of prisoners. Our VISTA leader got officials in Mercer County to, when reviewing juvenile criminal cases, explore whether an absentee parent is incarcerated and then make case recommendations from there. Another colleague makes regular appearances on a radio show in Sussex County, and Just One Mentoring was recently featured in the Star Ledger. I'm very happy to be here today because my greatest fear is that when my term of service is over, the children of prisoners are going to fall right back into the shadows. I hope that you, as policymakers and change agents, will consider implementing or helping to support a statewide mentoring program for children of prisoners. I recommend that the organization be capable of conducting its own recruiting, screening processes, trainings, and match supervision. I would also recommend that a strong partnership be established with the Department of Corrections well before the program begins. Using paid mentors and or making the program site-based would make volunteer recruitment go more smoothly. I also think that children of prisoners would benefit from a visitation program because kids should have the right to see, hear, and touch their parents. Um, it's been proven that uh, visitation, frequent visitation, reduces rates of recidivism. 
And I also think that implementing parenting classes that involve interactive prison visits from inmates' children would benefit kids and families. This past Wednesday, three of my fellow VISTAs and I met with social workers at Passaic County Jail. We also had the opportunity to tour the facility and speak with a group of inmates. Um, we talked with them about how their incarceration has, infect, has affected their relationship with their children, and it tore me apart. <coughs> One man told us that his children believe that he is not in jail, but rather working in a toy store in Georgia. His five-year-old son wets the bed, his six-year-old daughter is self-conscious about her weight, and his 16-year-old daughter is getting into all kinds of trouble at school. He blames himself. Another man told us that he is a Latin king who grew up on the streets of Patterson, never feeling love for or from anyone until he met his two daughters. Pictures of a tattooed, rough-looking man playing tea party with his two little girls were painted for us. Then he left us with the image of a defeated father crying with his bereaved daughters through a plexiglass window in a jail visiting booth. The meaning of the word mentor is derived from a combination of the Greek words mentos, which means with purpose, spirit, and passion, and meno, which means to remain, abide, continue, be present, endure. To me, this definition seems to be the embodiment of the elements, a spirited deliverance of purpose and stability that children of prisoners will graphs in the beginning of the morning program um, show, and I think it's always important to sort of take those graphs and put some faces to it, so I appreciate your words here in doing that. Um, so now I want to go open it up. I just want to sort of throw out some themes. You don't have to make your, con you know, your questions or comments about this, but just things that I've heard all morning that are recurring. Um, one is we've heard this term evidence-based programming a lot. I have to say, and I've been at the Wilson School since 98, I've taught as a lecturer here, I've I've read the word evidence-based programming so many times, and I think it's a pretty empty phrase, to be honest. Um, so as we throw it about, perhaps um, some of our panelists... Oh. <laughs> okay, it's not an empty phrase. Huh? <laughs> 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 it's the <most> researchers <laughs> judging me. Anyway, I do too think it's an empty phrase. Anyway, uh, so if we can sort of flush that out, because I think we use it a lot, evidence-based can be I did one survey of 20 people in a community of solid base, so um, that would be interesting. Um, I've also heard a lot about this research practitioner model, which I think is very interesting in the linking of the two, and perhaps we could flesh out a little bit what the mechanics of that is. Um, who initiates these relationships? Is it the researchers? Is it the practitioners? It is, is it both? Who pays for it? How do these things really work in practice? Um, also, the, I've heard the word partnership a lot. Again, I think it's one of those somewhat empty phrases, and I'd love to hear some more meat given to what partnerships mean, especially the free ones, yeah. so, <laughs> and hear about that. Um, another thing that I've heard is sustainability. We certainly heard that in a very profound way from our last speaker, from Elise. Um, sustainability is a huge issue. You all don't need me to tell you that, but it's something that is recurring. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, this sort of uh, program of the day, and the thing that gets a lot of attention sometimes takes over from well-established programs, um, and whether there's um, good reason for that or not is something we might flesh out. And finally, just this link between parenting and incarceration. I mean, all of you know this link, and it's in your day-to-day -day life, but my guess is most people in the world don't. And that to put these links together between mass incarceration and the lack of, a, of um, and what it's doing to our families is a link that's really not made in public, and so maybe we could pay some attention to that in the conversation. So that's all I'll throw out, um, and let's just make this a conversation. If you have questions, ask them. If you have comments, yep. I just had, had a uh, comment on the whole idea of relationships. We certainly came out strongly in the, in the first panel with the family relationships, and then into the community relationships that. So, you talked about the ending of what you least said. There's certainly 
uh, the parents um, that are incarcerated, we see that frequently um, with our patients in Trenton, to the point where um, the whole expectation of them, we say it so freely now that it's not even like a big deal. And I'm just going to quickly, on a case that we just reviewed on Monday, a mother had recently uh, passed, and the young man's being raised by the sister, and it was kind of almost put out there in no huge deal that the father, at least at the time of file, was incarcerated. Um, it's huge. I think it speaks to huge of relationship. With this young man, we have something in place, a program in mind to refer to, but you know, the gut says that without that relationship in place, without that Arachi mentor, or without that person, it's kind of really raised the expectation for that youth. There's a community that's already way low. The community is already very, very low for that child. <coughs> All these things have happened over the years. Without that special person, the program might work, and it's a, it's a good program, but the gut says we need to link in. You want to call it a mentor, but that caring adult, it's going to raise the expectation and really be there. So um, I think going along the starfish, or without is what, what I, Richard said. For that young man, we know right now, we're not changing the whole system, but for that young man, we need to find somebody in our community that's going to take one of those women. <coughs> My name's Luke. Um, I have a very jumbled thought, and I hope you all can help me straighten it out. Um, the, the question I have, no, it's a question. It's, it's around this informal source of support and trying to map that. It goes to the issue of uh, the caring adults, the last person just talked about. In every community you, you go to, there are always people there if you spend any time there. They're there at nighttime, kind of most of us might be. There are these informal sources of support that we don't always match because we don't know about them. They're not in an institution. They're not in, um, they, they can't be picked up easily in any survey, but they're there. They reach the kids. Sometimes they're coaches. I, I'm a coach. I've been coaching in several communities throughout New Jersey for, for many, many years. And I always, and I always understood the connection I had with the kids, but I always understood also that no one ever asked my opinion about these 30 some kids I spent so many hours with during the day. Now, I'm, there are lots of groups around us, you know, doing the kind of volunteer work out there across communities in the country, um, but they're never the source of, of study. I think Victor Rapucci at Virginia, University of Virginia, talked about this being the most, the organized youth sport field being the most understudied phenomenon in America. Close to 50 of the 0 to 18 population, close to 50 million kids participate, but we don't really study it as a source of either uh, an asset or as a detriment because in low income communities, in many cases, um, a lot of the fathers we talk about coming out of periods of incarceration, they're very heavily involved in the out of school time youth sports. So, for a whole host of reasons, it's one of these settings that is not mapped. It's not studied for its ability to connect to disadvantaged fathers and so forth, or for families for that matter. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your, um, first off the room, I guess, your reflections on how we begin to bring these kind of informal sources more into the field so it can be studied a little bit better. Sure, um, and it, it's funny because um, there's a student at Temple, not in my department in criminal justice, but in um, public health, who's doing her dissertation on just that. The, the, the broader idea, not the sports participation coach relationship, but the idea that these informal supports for youth need to be measured. So her, her, her dissertation is doing um, community-based participatory work to see what those informal supports are and then figure out, interestingly tied back to research, how you ask questions in a survey that would then tap into that type of support. So I can tell you just from the student of mine, she's working on that and trying to look at it in a larger way in Philadelphia. So she's doing some things. The second thing I would say is we're very lucky in the research field that the study of social networks is becoming so popular and moving to the foreground. So people, it, it, it's very difficult to do these types of studies because they're incredibly time consuming. The burden is on the respondent if you're doing a self-report survey 
where you ask an individual who, who in a very, um, not, you wouldn't say who is most influential to you, you would say who do you spend time with or, or who um, is important to you. And you, you ask a prompt and the individual, the youth, elicits these individuals in their life that are important. And we're doing this, a study that I'm running now in DC is doing this with high risk gang youth and youth that are in gang communities where we've asked them the question specifically to top, tap into who their influences are and how they knew them. Because most of the studies on social networks of youth are done in a school-based setting where the closed network is, here's a list of kids that are in your school. Do you hang out with them? Do you smoke cigarettes with them? Do you commit crimes with them? We specifically set out to to go into a neighborhood and take a contiguous neighborhood and interview every youth between the ages of 14 and 24 and say, who is important to you? And then think about what that means with regard to gang membership, delinquency, drug use, and drug dealing. So, and there's others, there's at least, I'd say a half dozen researchers in the criminological field that are starting to come together with the network experts to think about how to capture what you're talking about. And when you were talking, I wrote down a note. I don't think when we asked the individuals in our survey in Maryland, we surveyed 200 youth, when we said, how do you know this person? I don't think we had coach listed as one of the responses. We did have other, but any researchers in the room, you know what happens to the other category. <laughs> Everything gets mushed together. So now I know we just wrote, we're, we're proposing a study now to the Department of Justice to look at gang desistance and how people leaving gangs, who are the people that are important to them and how the networks matter. And if we get that funding, we're gonna ask your questions. I just, I wanna follow up on that, but that is one of the issues we are trying to uh, ascertain in our public schools with students about informal uh, support networks. And um, we've also, part of this came from some of our criminal justice research. We were looking at uh, female offenders returning to society and we're finding out that they were not indicating that their um, spouses or parents were the, um, their, the person that they were most connected to or others. So from that, we started looking at these more informal um, networks. And just to throw out something else, the informal economy becomes a huge uh, support that we've been studying, trying to figure out how to get a grasp on. So, you can, actually. Um, I found out that parole officers keep notes on whether people are employed informally or formally. So I think this is a whole other wealth of data is to get these informal networks, financial, social support, et cetera. So it's something that we're looking at as well. Did you have teachers on that list? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, yes, teachers and um, not just formal classroom teachers, but aides in a lot of classrooms. Uh, students see, um, it could be because students have, so students have IEPs, but there's an aide in the classroom. They often have identified that individual as being someone that they um, see as a support network. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Uh, I sit in a policy and an advocacy uh, job, and I read a lot of research, and I talk to a lot of legislators and policymakers in the executive branch. Uh, and the very most important thing that I do is translate uh, complicated things into sound bites and to translate them wherever possible into cost benefit language. Uh, and cost benefit language is the only language, the only language that policymakers listen to today. The reason we reduce chronic homelessness by a third in this country is because of that article of the million dollar Murray that you quoted earlier. Um, so this, the most, you know, I'm very encouraged by the Newark study that, that you're doing, but I'd like to suggest that, that the Newark schools are not your client, not your only client, but that the citizens of New Jersey are your client, because it's in our enlightened self-interest to pay whatever it costs and to create mentoring programs or whatever works uh, to, to raise that graduation rate from 53% to 90%, uh, because otherwise we're going to pay $40,000 and more a year for incarceration. And that, that's the language we need to be speaking in, and that's the language that funders really need to encourage uh, our researchers to be translating their work into. Actually, so. I, if you looked at my objective sheet, one of the 
important ones um, was actually that we look at, I didn't use the word cost benefit, but what are the costs for these programs and what are the actual outcomes per cost? So that's a really critical part of our analysis. Um, so we, we now have to speak to policy makers. <laughs> we have different presentations for commissioners than we do for uh, academics. Can I make a quick a comment to add to that? And I'm sure you know of the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, the, the institute in Washington State that, that creates a, a place where costs and benefits about every program. Um, with it, WSIPP.com or Washington State Institute for Public Policy. They have made it. Their, their mission in life is to make sure every program is put in terms of in dollars and cents of what it means. And, and it has helped push forward evidence-based, but truly evidence-based programs. I'm going to use the phrase, but you know, we, we hope that people know what sound, sound evidence is. And, and, and it shows you, you can look up a list of programs across the country for youth and put dollar and cents to it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, Luckily, policymakers have taken note of what's happening in Washington State. The mayor of D.C. two years ago, the, the late the, the mayor who just lost in re-election, Mayor Fenty, brought the model, the Washington State model, to Washington, D.C. and he developed something called, um, when he put out funding, an Urban Institute and Brookings Institution together created the District of Columbia Crime Policy Institute to solely do what you're talking about talk about the costs and benefits. Anything that's going on in the city needs to be framed. So there's actually a, a broader model, not just program by program, but a place. You know, I think governors and mayors who are really at the forefront of thinking about research and, and moving it into practice are doing this and they're doing it on a broader scale. Thank you. I just wanted to um, highlight something that I don't hear a lot about approaching um, her work in this manner, and that's to look at a systems approach and not so much the silo approach that mental health, there's only mental health population or that the housing um, support institutes only support those that need housing, but when you know, families are touched by all of these areas of concern and issues that, you know, how much is being paid attention to when eligibility requirements or when, um, you know, when, when an individual is trying to navigate all these different systems the roadblocks that they often face that they can't access then these resources that are in their communities because of, you know, they're at this level of income or they're at um, this, they, they don't necessarily have a diagnosis or, you know, they haven't gotten their health treatment or, you know, so on and so forth and the interplay of how much that impacts families' well-being, children's well-being and their graduation rates and, and you know, fathers and, and, and their ability to bond with their children and so on. So I just really want to highlight that the systems approach is so important we have to look at when um, programs are funding you know services that they have to look at how does it interplay with other resources and services in the community um, and how much does it create actually a barrier um, so I just think it's good. Thank you. Thank you. In the last few years, I've been, I've been working at a mental health uh, agency in Newark. Obviously, we have our hands full with uh, Astral County in Newark. But we have been trying to implement some of the evidence-based programs because uh, recently, as people who are writing grants right now, every grant, every funder is asking for you to use an evidence-based program, and then there's a list you have to choose from, and you know, so on and so forth. But I have... Uh, just on the side, like I have seen like people write it into the program, it's funded, but the, the second piece is missing where that program is not being monitored by an outside agency. And uh, one of the things like I, you know, um, I really believe in is that the research has to be done because I'm inside, it's like the systemic thing. You know, I'm inside the family, I'm working with the family of uh, four, five, six people. But as a supervisor would be an outside window telling me, okay, you're not looking at this because you're looking at this person so closely. And I think it's really important for programs to have that part in the funding run that says, okay, 7% or 10% or whatever, some substantial amount should be used 
for people to from outside to come and say, I'm not going to take away your funding, but I'm going to support you in improving your program. And I think that's very important when a program is getting funded, that that piece sustains all throughout the program. And then maybe that creates a way for us to kind of sustain the program further. Like the funding, mostly coming out from JGC or some other offices, are for three years. And then you have to write a piece at the end of the grant is how would you sustain this program for after the funding is over or when we are reducing the funding. So I think that policy piece of you know the research, the whatever the air program is doing needs to be twice a year during the, uh, the course of the program and has to be supported by the funders. And then you know that lays the ground and foundation for further funding of that specific program and sustainability of that program. So it kind of grows with the research and grows, I mean, that's, you know, that's something that I'm learning and you know, I'm writing that into most of the things that I'm writing into right now. But it's just like, you know, we're talking about policy and stuff. So I think it's important for people to understand that for funders, it's very important that we are collaborating with doctors or we're collaborating with you know, different schools in our area that this is an important piece that needs to be considered and not, you know, call, calling us back and saying, sorry, we cannot support this piece of uh, your program. I used to want in our, you know, foundation reports and the sustainability question I was wanted to say, my sustainability plan is that you're going to give me more money. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that doesn't work. Well, it's important for sustainability and replication because um, just from our experience, we did a study on another reentry program and the, the reduction in recidivism was so high, and it was not a rate, we actually did you know, statistics, and our model, predictive model was so strong that the program ended up expanding. And I think that's really important. You ended up not having, just not relying also on foundation support, but you had you know, government agencies saying, wow, this is actually making an impact. How, why don't we pick it up? Why don't we start seeing it? So I think it's both for your sustainability but as well as, as, as a best practice. Do you, do you want to touch on that? Sure. Um, I have two things I just want to throw out because you said you know the research practitioner partnerships at the beginning and then you brought it up. I, I um, the Department of Justice every year for the last three years has had a solicitation um, to support research practitioner partnerships. It's a separate solicitation, which is just phenomenal when you think about it. It could be any topic related to, to crime. I think this year in the solicitation, which closed a, a month or two ago, it's usually in the spring, they said we encourage. Um, programs um, and focus on juvenile justice issues. So there was more this this year, but but it's very expansive. And and so there, so you can do an evaluator, the research partner can do formative feedback at the same time and really work with developing the capacity of the organization, as opposed to just coming in saying, I'm a partner, I'm going to collect data, I'm going to give you some data, but but really say every couple months, this is what we're finding. Oh, this is what you want the eligibility criteria to be, well, but, but you're changing, oh, you're changing the eligibility criteria every few months. That's not, we can't evaluate that. You know, you're going to change the evaluability criteria because you have a reentry program and then you realize, hey, I'm going to go recruit people from a homeless shelter, I'm going to tell you we can't evaluate that. And you're, but if you're not working with a researcher, you're going to come to me six months later and say, I want you to evaluate my program. You know what I'm going to say? I can't evaluate your program, and this is why. So one of the techniques that some of the government agencies have used is doing something called an evaluability assessment. And in the past, Department of Justice has funded just a minuscule amount of funded. It's funded researchers to go out, look at programs that they're anecdotally hearing are working, and have a researcher do a site visit and write up a 10-page report, can this program be evaluated? I, I truly believe that you've got to be working with a researcher from the beginning, or you've got to have a researcher come in and say, you want your program to become an evidence-based program? This is what you need to do. Oh, you're only serving 10 families a year? Well, that's great. <laughs> We're not going to be able to do, and you're doing a heck of a great job with the 10 families, but statistically, are you going to be able to show an effect? Maybe if you're doing MFT, FFT, and all of that, you show an effect with a small sample size, but there are certain criteria. So building up a partnership. And the, the good researchers out, out there, they want to work with you. They want to work with you and help. They're not just there to write the, you know, write the report and get a publication out. It, it's, it's really, in, in criminal justice, sociology, anthropology, it is about affecting change. 
Well, I think with that comment, we're going to stop <laughs> and thank our panelists. So thank you to our panelists again and to everyone that helped make this a wonderful and rich discussion today. Just a, a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Um, one is with respect to evidence-based practice. Um, as a practitioner, the only thing that I want to say to evidence-based practice is the notion of practice-based evidence. <laughs> and that you work with us and you talk to us as practitioners so that together we are really putting something that is strong, that's based on the research, that's based on the practice, and that actually has an influence and effect on the people that we assist. The, the second is, I just want to go back to this partnership thing. One of the things that we're looking at doing is working on a coordinated resource management process. So how do you take agencies, whether they're in the state or local partnerships, to come together? So it's through our municipal planning boards that we have, or even at the state level, where we begin to talk about leveraging the resources. And one of the things that you said was, how do you actually make sure what you're doing actually is making sense and really not in opposition to some of the other goals of some of the other agencies. So we are looking at how this whole coordinated resource management process, not where we tell you how to use your money, but how we can leverage and build upon the dollars that are out there and be really smart about the resources that we have and how we use those resources. And then one of the things that Elizabeth said is that how do you get to these partnerships? So I, I just want to end um, with this. When we began to look at the Office of Community Justice and Attorney General Paula Dow collapsed the uh, reentry and prevention and law enforcement related initiatives together into the Office of Community Justice, um, I had the responsibility of really taking on prevention. And when we looked at prevention, we said, well, what's already going on in New Jersey? One, I didn't know, what is prevention exactly? As an adult uh, criminal justice person, I wanted to figure out what, is, what does that mean? And so we began to do the work and the research around what justice prevention. And so we looked at the different models and we talked about that. And then we said, well, then who's doing the work already? And as we began to do that, we, we found a few of you who are already doing some of the work who I've already knew. But then we found other new partners. And so, when we um, stumbled upon the future of children, we said, wow, look at the research. We were all on their website. We were pulling articles out and just having a good time. And, you know, do you believe this is what, what they have already? And so basically, we said, well, we need, to, we need to partner with them. And so we called one day, cold. And we said, by the way, we did a little policy stuff. We're actually out here. We need some help. And you have all this great research. Could we talk to you? Um, so myself, Dr. Elena, and Michael Simmons, we actually, in Farrah Rahman, we came to meet with you and your team. And they opened the doors and they said, wow, you're really interested in learning as you think about policy and what to do about the research? And we said, yes, could we, could we work with you? And so you graciously opened up that door. But the fact that they allowed us to do it and the fact that you, one, had the courage to knock on the door cold and say, we need your help. We'd really like to know um, more about this. So I just want to end there and thank you again and your entire team for are being supportive because not just this process, they've been working with us on all the youth development forums and helping us bring this discussion to you. And so I just want to thank you again on behalf of the Attorney General for joining us in this rich discussion. We'll see you again one more time in Camden on June 13th. Thank you.